Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to... What are we doing? Exploring the Lord of the Rings. That's what we're doing. It's Tuesday. I'm forgetting what day it was there for a second. Um, uh, welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. Uh, excited to continue the Council of Elrond if we are... Okay, look, it's not really actually realistic. We've got about six slides, I think, left in Elrond's initial speech. Um, maybe five. So I, I highly doubt we'll do all of those tonight. Um, but, uh, but we're getting close. Fortnite, and we're through with that, and then on to our next speaker. So we are just sailing through the Council of Elrond so far. Um, uh, so glad you guys could join us. Today's uh, The title of today's class is The Paradox of Middle-Earth History. I'm really interested uh, to talk about something I've been thinking about um, in response to tonight's reading. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. A couple quick announcements first. Uh, two upcoming moots that I want to make sure to draw everybody's attention to. Uh, first, the nearest moot that is coming up soonest is Tex Moot. Uh, Tex Moot is on the 8th of February, uh, featuring Tolkien Maven as the keynote speaker. Um, and so that's going to be down in Houston on the 8th of February. I encourage you to go to signumuniversity.org. If you scroll down a little, you'll see uh, the uh, uh, the links for those. We have... Um, uh, text moot on the 8th. We also have SoCal moot. So uh, uh, our Southern California moot, um, which is going to be, it's in, actually we're going to have it in Hollywood this year, uh, in fact. So I can confirm two pretty cool things. One is the date. I can confirm the date of SoCal moot, which has been a little bit up in the air for a little bit, but I can confirm it now. It is the 22nd of February. Um, so on Saturday, February 22nd, we'll be... Um, uh, we'll be looking, uh, we'll be doing, uh, our, our, our second SoCal moot. Uh, we call it LA moot. We're changing the name because I want to be a little more inclusive to the Southern California region. Uh, so, uh, so that's happening on the 22nd. But, uh, here's the other cool thing. The location of, um, uh, SoCal moot, uh, that is, uh, SoCal moot is going to be hosted at, uh, at Netflix, actually. Um, so we're going to be, uh, at the Netflix, uh, uh, headquarters in one of their screening rooms, and we're going to be, uh, uh, discussing, uh, adaptation and discussing things there. So, uh, that's a, a really fun kind of, um, uh, immediate context for some of the discussions that we're going to be having. Uh, so I hope you can join us there. Um, uh, we're having a, the, the, I think the registration site for that is not open yet, but it's, we're getting there. I just wanted to make sure to mention it, uh, to, uh, to save the date for thoughtless. Yes. Dave did make that happen. So, uh, uh, that was, uh, uh Dave, uh, Dave, Dave worked that out for us. Um, so that's the 22nd is, uh, so Calmoot, uh, the registration should be up, uh, I hope here within this next week. Uh, but you can keep an eye out for that. Just want to make sure to save the date with folks and, uh, text moot. Of course you can register for, and many have already, and that's coming up soon on the 8th of February. And then of course, we're looking towards sunshine moot in March down in Florida. And that's going to be great, uh, but it's a little bit further away. So we're focused for now on the February moots. Uh, so, uh, uh, so there we go. Okay. And, um, uh, other announcements. So keep an eye out soon. Very soon. We will be opening early bird registration for myth moot seven, uh, which is going to be awesome. Uh, same location, similar time frame. last weekend of June as when we'll be holding myth moot as usual. Uh, and, uh, as I say, registration for that, the early bird registration will begin, very soon. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and, uh, we also, um, uh, we also have, uh, of course, our, our, our spring semester at Signum and our MA program, uh, has started this week. So it's always an exciting time when a new ses new semester begins. Um, we have our new course on classical myths and legends that we're offering this semester, uh, so that, uh, you, you there's still time to join. Uh, if you've been thinking about joining, don't delay too long because now is the time, of course, uh, as the semester is beginning. It's still possible to sign up for classes now uh, and get in there, whether you want to audit or whatever. Um, but um, but that's uh, um, uh, time is now uh, for doing that. Uh, Lil Atomic, uh, we are talking about a Canada moot. Uh, we're thinking about maybe August, uh, in the Toronto area. That's the, uh, so Maple Moot, Maple Moot is, uh, 
is in process. We have several that are that are in process at the um, uh, for this for this year. Uh, we're looking at uh, we're looking at our first Canadian moot, maple moot. Uh, we're looking at dragon moot over in Wales. Um, we're looking at Nippon moot in Japan in late September. Um, uh, dragon moot in Wales in early September. Uh, so lots of um, uh, really interesting possibilities as well, of course, as the, uh, the round of many other of our moots are repeat moots, such as Sunshine Moot in March down in Florida and uh, Magnolia Moot uh, down in North Carolina in April. Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, I see, uh, uh, there's, uh, um, it calls for, uh, a Rocky Mountain moot or Rocky Mooten uh, in Denver. Uh, yes, um, that's uh, something we've thought of, actually. Um, uh, we'll see. I'm open to the possibility of it. Denver's hard because it's a little bit uh, like isolated. That is, most of our other moots, we try to hold them in places where you can get, like you can get to it from multiple different cities and stuff and. Denver's kind of just Denver. <laughs> it's not really. There's not really any other place that's uh, uh, that's that's convenient to it. So, anyway, uh, we will see. And uh, a Music City moot, definitely Angrist. We had New England moot in September of this past year, and we're definitely going to be having New England moot again, possibly the very beginning of October, um, somewhere around there. Um, that's definitely going to happen again uh, this this uh, this this year, this calendar year. As well, of course, as do Middle Moot will be back in uh, in uh, Kansas City in October. Uh, Bay Moot, uh, I believe, is going to happen again out in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, so uh, lots of moot activity. Um, exactly, Tora Martin. That's my fear: is that a Denver moot would be more of a lonely mountain moot. Uh, yeah, who knows? Um, uh, yeah. So <clears throat> anyhow, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's lots of moots upcoming, but again, I want to, uh, remind you that, um, uh, that the two upcoming ones, right. Uh, the, the, the two upcoming ones are, um, uh, text moot the 8th of February and SoCal moot, uh, down in Hollywood on the 22nd of February. Uh, and I am all excited. We've got my travel all set for both of them. I'm all ready to go. Uh, excited to get out there. Okay. Um, let us get back into the text here. Um, let's, oh, well, actually, okay. So before we start our, we go back to the Council of Elrond. Uh, Praise Moyer, I wanted to respond to your uh, question that you posted. Uh, since uh, this post is in celebration of myself and my sister Gloria, music gal, finally catching up. In honor of this, I want to briefly drag the discussion all the way back to the Shire, which we raced through so hastily before the class took a more sensible pace. I've always noticed the parallel in Tolkien's choice of phrasing between Bilbo leaving Bag End in a long-expected party, he jumped over a low place in the hedge at the bottom and took to the meadows, passing into the night like a rustle of wind in the grass, and Frodo leaving the Shire in three his company. They jumped over the low place in the hedge at the bottom and took to the fields, passing into the darkness like a rustle in the grasses. Much has been discussed in this class about the differences between Bilbo's first journey uh, and Frodo's journey in The Lord of the Rings. However, this parallel phrasing emphasizes to me that similarities between the two hobbits, especially the fact that neither return permanently to the Shire or Bag End after leaving it. Yeah, um, I agree. This is, um, this is, th that's a really good point. Uh, I, 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 I totally agree. As for the larger point, uh, about the parallels, um, First of all, don't you get the sense that like that low place in the hedge is like where they always went, right? Like, you know, one of those places where like the people who live there never actually use the main road, right? It's like the shortcut they take so often that there's probably a path, right, uh, across the field. Um, but um, anyway, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, JJ says there's a reason it's low, right? Yeah, probably so. Um, but um, anyway... 
the larger point that I would say, uh, praise more in response to, uh, to that is uh, you're absolutely right. And a lot is made. I mean, Frodo, I mean, I, I've been kind of following Frodo and Gandalf, you know, in their discussion in chapter two in emphasizing the differences between the two of them. Um, you know, Frodo's famous speech about, you know, there and back again, he, you know, uh, goes to, to lose a treasure, right. And not return all those sort of gloomy contrasts, right. That he was making to, uh, uh, to Bilbo's quest. And those are all certainly true, but remember that in addition to this, passage, which I agree is quite uh, purposefully similar, right? It would seem. Um, apart from this, you even have the, the passage. Remember that in the almost in the very moment that Frodo is contemplating how different his quest is, his journey is from Bilbo's, he is the narrator tells us that he feels swelling up within him a desire to run out without his pocket handkerchief like Bilbo did years before, right? That desire for adventure, um, uh, that uh, keen interest in... F so, like, he's, he's, he's aware that his journey is going to be different, and yet even he is sort of struck by... The, the the similarities as well the parallels as well and Kurtzimus yeah of course the 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 repetition of the road goes ever on poem certainly uh, again very forcefully reinforces that now we it's easy to make a big deal about that that one word difference which is an important difference right the pursuing it with eager feet from Bilbo and the pursuing it with weary feet from Frodo that's a that's a very conspicuous change but at the end of the day it still is only one word right they still are singing the same song they still are having the same you know and Frodo even feels like he's making it up right uh certainly not merely um uh recalling it so um anyway I, I agree. But I, I, the, the thing that I would say even beyond that, kind of taking a, a step back further from that and thinking through the implications of um, the parallel between them. Like, so obviously, I, I, OK. One thing, of course, to say is that in some ways the similarities outweigh the differences. Like one of the reasons to emphasize the differences in the shape of their quest and their attitudes when they set out is that otherwise they are so similar, right? They're even the same age, right? And, uh, and again, Frodo is aware of that. It's like he turns 50 and he's like, okay, it's like time for the parallel adventure to befall me now. Right. Uh, you know, he's, he's all primed for exactly, uh, for exactly that kind of interaction. Um, you know, that, that kind of parallel. So even Frodo is anticipating the parallel, like assuming the parallel between the two of them. And so the bigger picture statement that I would want to make about that is, I guess, two things. One is we can, on the one hand, say that going back to Gandalf's words, right? Remember how Gandalf says that um, he can make it in the, the, the line I always tease Gandalf for, right? He can say it no plainer than to say that Bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its maker, in which case you also were meant to have it. And that may be a comforting thought, though Frodo does not indeed find it comforting, right? But again, to take Gandalf's larger point there, right? is that um, there is some other power that is shaping things. And even if we go back to The Hobbit and we think of all of the emphasis on luck, and then, of course, the, the final at the very end of the book, Gandalf's statements about how, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the luck is not just luck and, and that all these things were not just done uh, for Bilbo's own benefit. Um, our attention is drawn at the very end. And, and again, throughout, if we're paying attention, as I tried to argue in my Hobbit book, um, that, you know, Bilbo is being guided here. Bilbo is an instrument, right, of something else, right, uh, which we're not told exactly what, um, uh, who is undertaking this, right? So um, Bilbo has his adventure not by chance, right, uh, and the opportunities that he's given whether it's finding the ring or, uh, you know, discovering Smaug's weak, weak spot or whatever is, um, uh, 
you know, it's, these are all opportunities that have been sort of provided for him. His choices matter. That's one of the things that I find so interesting about The Hobbit. This is not just a, a fate story. It's not just a destiny story. Um, uh, Tolkien is really... Um, uh, Tolkien is is really even-handed in thinking about both the way in which Bilbo's story has been kind of ordained, right, and, and shaped by fate, but also how his own choices have legitimately impacted it, right? And this is something. It's 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 really both of those things operating together. Um, and so here's Frodo. Frodo knows this story, right? And I think that Frodo knows this as well that his, uh, you know, his Uncle Bilbo's adventure was not. Um, just a random adventure, right? So Frodo's anticipation is not just superstition, right? I mean, it might be otherwise be like, well, Bilbo was 50 when adventure came to him and I've just turned 50. So maybe adventure will come to me. Like if I thought something like that, you know, about something that happened like to my father at some point in his life. And when I turned that age, be assuming that that same thing was going to happen to me. I mean, that's, that's just kind of magical thinking, right? That's just, uh, that's the way superstition works. Um, but that's, uh, but I don't think that that's what's going on with Frodo, right? Um, there is a sense uh, that uh, Frodo knows right? that there is like a calling on him, right? That he has a purpose. Bilbo, of course, was completely taken by surprise by his calling, right? By his adventure. He had no idea it was coming. He didn't even know it was happening after it had begun, right? Um, but he has had time to process that now. And Frodo has had time to process uh, the significance of his uncle's adventure, right? And so when he is anticipating adventure, it is much more of a, uh, much more of a, of a sort of deliberate thing, right? Like he is aware of the fact that there may be some purpose upon him, that there is some calling upon him, that adventure is going to come upon him, not necessarily, not as out of the blue uh, as it did upon uh, Bilbo, because he's forewarned, but that he's kind of preparing for that. Um, one of the things that I would point to here, Tolkien didn't often talk about this but he did talk about it a couple times, this idea of uh, a calling being upon them. And he, when he talked about it, he talked about it in the context of ex answering a question about why Bilbo and Frodo were bachelors. Um, the text, of course, observes that Bilbo and Frodo were, as bachelors, quite exceptional, that it was unusual for hobbits to remain unmarried throughout their lives. Right. And when Tolkien explained why, when somebody asked, why, 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 why don't they ever get married? Why does neither of them, why doesn't Bilbo settle down finally, right? And get married after he returns. He, he could have done, presumably, right? Um, and Tolkien's answer is that, like, neither of them, there was something, right? Some kind of, and not something necessarily even that either one of them consciously understood. Right. But both of them had this sense of like holding themselves in readiness. Right. Think of Sam and Sam's situation when he comes back home and gets married. Right. He gets married to Rose and this is a great thing. But of course, he's very torn in two. Right. Um, when the need to go and do something, even a smallish thing uh, like um, uh, like accompany Frodo on his last journey, even though that journey is not going to be nearly as long as the previous one was, right? It's hard for him to do it, right? Because he's, he's torn in two. He is tied to the Shire. He is, he has undertaken responsibilities. I mean, he's gotten married, he's sworn oaths, right? It's what you do. It's what a vow is when you get married. Um, so, and that both Frodo and Bilbo, Tolkien says, have some kind of sense, you know, that um, that it's important for them to um, not do that, right? Uh, for them to not be tied in that way, to you know, it, 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 to, to to be free to go. And Kurtzimus, yes, it is like a Catholic priest, and I do think 
uh, that Tolkien's uh, 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 Catholic religion influenced this. Um, Vaguely. I mean, I'm not saying he's trying to draw a direct parallel, but what I am saying is that exactly the kind of calling um, that uh, that Catholic priests have, and it's a big part of the rationale for Catholic priests not marrying, is that they should not be tied to worldly things so that they can be freely available uh, to the callings of God. Um, and that is, again, so it's, it's not an exact parallel. He's not trying to say that Frodo and Bilbo are priests, but he, he does suggest a, 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 a general kind of similarity between those, um, um, between those, that sense of, that sense of calling. Um, but again, he emphasized that he, um, he emphasized that they didn't, neither one of them was deliberate about that. Neither of them made the decision. Neither of them were like, maybe I'll get married. No, I shouldn't get married. I should, I should make sure I stay a free agent so I can pick up and leave the Shire if I need to. Neither of them consciously went there, but neither of them also, neither of them had the, the, uh, the, the impulse, right. To settle down, right. And get married and start their own families and stuff because for some reason they felt that they needed to be, they needed to be free. Um, so anyway, um, that's, uh, <laughs> right, Matt Violetta says things would have been different if there had been a fairy wife in the offing, you know, can't rule that out. You know, that kind of thing doesn't come around by chance either, you know? So, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, anyhow, so, so that's, um, that's, Coming back, uh, Praise Moyer, to your question here, that I think is the biggest parallel between the two of them. You know, that both of them, you know, Bilbo unconsciously, but Frodo very deliberately, right? Of the two of them, Frodo is the one who does clearly feel, I, there seems to be in Frodo evidence for some kind of a conscious sense of a calling on him, right? Even, again, that, that, that line about thinking about the significance or om or ominousness right of his turning 50 um suggests that he has this sense like this is go it, it's going to fall upon me too right i also am going to be asked to do so and he he kind of wants that part of him is seeking that but part of him is afraid of that um so uh anyway i um I think that we can see that. And even even his response to Gandalf at the end of chapter two. Remember when Gandalf says, I didn't expect such an answer even from you. Right. Um, meaning he thought really highly of Frodo, but Gandalf found Frodo to be much more readily reconciled to the journey. Right. The idea. I mean, clearly Gandalf thought, although he had high respect for Frodo, it was going to take a lot of convincing, right? To convince him that he needed to leave the Shire and give it up for good and go away. And then instead here, he finds, um, here he finds Frodo ready to go primed and ready to go. Right. He's not like a hundred percent enthusiastic about it. He's, he's, there are lots of things that he's nervous about, but again, he, he quick, you know, that's why I think that's what we see in the swiftness with which Frodo says, um, you know, when Gandalf says, have you decided, um, you know, what you ought to do? And he says, well, I have to leave back and leave the Shire. And, you know, you know, he's like, yep. Okay. Like it's on, right. That's it. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. I'm seeing the, uh, questions about, um, uh, parallels with, uh, Tolkien's military service. Uh, yeah, he did volunteer. Yes, it is true. Um, uh, Scudo that, uh, to not to volunteer, uh, in, uh, the, you know, the outbreak of world war one was a tricky business. Um, so it's, it's a little, um, um, it's not quite a parallel. I don't think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Anyway, so so yeah, so praise Mario, thank you for bringing uh, our attention back to this. I do think it's an important thing to think of. And for me, this is the, you know, both of them, both of them are used as instruments, right? Are used as instruments of fate for the, you know, pursuit of, you know, these and Bilbo is used as the, you know, he is the ring finder and Bilbo is the, and Frodo is the ring bearer, right? Um, and the two of them both have really important parts to play, which, um, you know, th there's, th there's, there still are a lot of differences, right? Like, especially about how Bilbo had no idea what he was setting out to do even after he left, right? Um, and certainly nobody knew, not even Tolkien, of course, uh, that the most important role that he was going to be playing was finding that random ring halfway through his adventure, right? Um, so anyway, there's a lot of ways in which their situations are different. But at the end of the day, right, big picture, these are two hobbits who from the same, you know, from the same family in the same place at the same time in their lives are basically being tapped for, um, a similar kind of role, uh, a similarly significant role in the history of, you know, the end of the third age and the salvation of, of middle earth, right. The, and the, and the overcoming of the enemy. Um, so anyhow, um, all right, good. So let us now move back uh, to the text and hear Elrond talking about his own military service. How about that for a transition? Of Numenor he spoke, its glory and its fall, and the return of the kings of men to Middle-earth out of the deeps of the sea, borne upon the wings of storm. Then Elendil the Tall and his mighty sons, Isildur and Anarion, became great lords, and the North Realm they made in Arnor, and the south realm in Gondor, above the mouths of the Anduin. But Sauron of Mordor assailed them, and they made the last alliance of elves and men, and the hosts of Gilgalad and Elendil were mustered in Arnor. Thereupon Elrond paused a while and sighed. I remember well the splendor of their banners, he, re he said. It recalled to me the glory of the elder days, and the hosts of Beleriand. So many great princes and captains were assembled. And yet not so many, nor so fair, as when Thangorodrim was broken, and the elves deemed that evil was ended for ever, but it was not so. "'You remember?' said Frodo, speaking his thought aloud, through in his astonishment. "'But I thought,' he stammered as Elrond turned towards him, "'I thought that the fall of Gilgalad was a long age ago.' Okay. Um, so... First, back to his synopsis, you'll remember that in the previous passage that we ended with last week was when he was giving the full history of the ring lore, right? And he talked about Sauron making the rings and deceiving others and uh, uh, and, and about Celebrimbor and the war and the killing of Celebrimbor and the shutting of the gates of Moria, right? All that stuff, right? Um, then he segues to Numenor, its glory and its fall. And the return of men to middle, the kings of men to Middle Earth out of the deeps of the sea. And that has to be the shortest synopsis of the Numenor story ever, right? Of Numenor he spoke, its glory and its fall. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, that pretty much settles it. So what are we emphasizing, right? He only emphasizes two things. So try to try to. I, I want to follow along with this here because, of course, he's going to be segueing to be talking about the Numenorean realms in exile in a good deal more detail after this, right? That's sort of the next, um, uh, the next stage, right? In his narrative. Um, clearly we are only interested in Numenor for the sake of its backdrop to the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor, right? Um, of course, if he was telling the whole story of, of Sauron and Sauron's long history of quest for dominion over Middle-earth, uh, you know, he would probably have emphasized Sauron's role in the fall of Numenor and, um, and Sauron's own discomfiture, perhaps, uh, therein. Um, but he, um, he doesn't emphasize, we, we don't get him emphasizing those things, right? That's not what's emphasized to us. There are only two things that we learn about Numenor 
in this passage. And you remember, this is something we've been tracking, right? We've been going back and, and, and looking like how many times has Numenor or Westerness been mentioned? And we, we've been realizing in our conversations in the Hall of Fire that we really don't know very much, right, about Numenor. And here we're only told two things about it, right? It was glorious and it fell. That's it. That's all we know about Numenor from this uh, passage and, and the return of the kings of men to Middle Earth out of the deeps of the sea. The return of the kings of men to Middle Earth out of the deeps of the sea. Um, that is a really interesting phrasing on the part of, um, well, not Elrond necessarily, but of whoever our narrator is here, who is paraphrasing um, Elrond's speech, right? On the one hand, Kurtzimus, yeah, I mean, it's literally true, right? They left Middle-earth to, you know, the Adain left Middle-earth and went to Numenor in the first place, so they are returning. Um, but... Okay, so this is, this strikes me particularly forcefully because we've just been studying the Notion Club papers in our Sauron Defeated class that we did last year, right? Um, just like six months ago, um, you know, within the last six months. And um, in Sauron Defeated, which he wrote, by the way, soon after he wrote this, um, the Notion Club papers gets written. Um, so he decides to go back to the Numenor legends and flesh those out a little bit. And uh, because, you know, he's inventing a new language, Adunayak, um, in the middle of writing The Lord of the Rings, like probably during the gap that happens um, in The Two Towers uh, before he um, uh, like you know, he gets everybody to Dunharrow and then. And then pauses, we're told. Uh, and uh, when he after he comes back from from that little gap in the writing of the text, uh, he tackles book four, the approach of Frodo and Sam to Mordor. This is that's based on the account that he gives uh, in the preface uh, to the second edition. But in that gap, um, according to Christopher Tolkien, is when the Notion Club papers were written. Um, so. Uh, That further th those further thoughts about Numenor are kind of growing along in this text. Therefore, I want to be careful about something. Don't think of the Akalabeth. Try not to think about the Akalabeth, because a lot of the Akalabeth is written at and immediately after the time that he was writing the Notion Club papers. That is, um, just as... In my Hobbit book, I tried to explain that as counterintuitive as it may seem, the Gollum that we read in chapter five of The Hobbit, though The Hobbit was published so many years before The Lord of the Rings was published, yet The Hobbit that we read in chapter five of The Lord of the Rings is based, or sorry, the Gollum that we read in chapter five of The Hobbit is, you know, I say that. Let me try again. The Gollum that we read in chapter five of The Hobbit is based on the Gollum of the Two Towers and Return of the King, not the other way around. Because he wrote his first Gollum, then he developed the character of Gollum through the writing of The Lord of the Rings. Then after he wrote The Lord of the Rings, he went back and rewrote chapter five of The Hobbit, right? So um, although it, it's, it's sort of out of chronological order, if we read chapter five of The Hobbit and, and, tr and think to ourselves, oh, well, that's where this stuff in The Two Towers comes from. No, that's not how it worked. It worked the other way around, right? Generally, it worked the other way around. Um, the same is true of the Numenor stuff, right? The, when we're reading what he's writing here in, this, in The Fellowship of the Ring, when he's referring to Westerness, and Numenor, a lot of the time he does go back and revise, of course, later on and later on in the process. But a lot of this early stuff that he has in here, um, it's not based on the Akalabeth. The Akalabeth is based on this. It grew out of this and it's not yet fully formed. Um, so, um, 
uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's a little, com- but that's why I think I want for the sake of understanding this narrative as it is, right? I'm not saying we have to pretend to like go back to where he was when he wrote his first draft into the preliminary understanding he had of the story of the Numenorians and, and just pretend like that's the only story and ignore all of his later developments and revisions of the story. I'm not saying that that would be kind of silly and difficult, but what I am saying, this is why I have been systematically attempted to be systematically resistant um, to going back too often to Silmarillion stuff, to other things that we think we know. Right. And using those other things as a basis for interpreting the text in front of us here. Right. Because often, not always, but often that's misleading. Right. And it often works the other way around that this text is forming, is in the process of forming the basis and the context for those other texts. Right. Which we feel like are the behind the scenes things that we the data, you know, that we can bring to this text. So. If when you read of Numenor, he spoke its glory and, and its fall, the Akalabeth is running through your head, try to stop. Try to stop, right? Because we're, we're not there yet, right? We're not there yet. Um, so, okay. So where are we then? Again, where we are is wanting to take this one step at a time. Um, remember what? Frodo and Gandalf said about the Numenorians back when he first woke up at the beginning of uh, many meetings, right? Is Strider one of the people of the old kings? Right? The Numenorians are so, are associated with kings and kingship from the beginning. They are the people, the great people, right? The people of the kings. That is the primary thing. Now, that story, as I say, is going to get complicated as he moves forward. The reason I brought up the Notion Club papers in the first place, that place where Tolkien will be going in the next couple years after he wrote this passage, um, is because in the Notion Club papers, the dominant emphasis that Tolkien makes through that is that the Numenorians who come to Middle-earth are not kings returning to Middle-earth out of the deeps of the sea. I mean, they kind of are. But that's not how they view it, right? They are exiles who have been banished from Numenor and feel themselves to be banished. Um, uh, so the whole like tone and spirit of the Numenor story is going to be growing and changing um, over the next couple of years from here, right? So to me, this is one of the reasons why that phrase, the return of the kings of men to Middle-earth, feels to me so significant, right? So important because, well, it's important, right? Uh, this is what we're being asked to associate it with. Now, remember, it does have a fall, right? It does have a fall. So we know something went wrong. We know that the story of Numenor is not just a happy story from one end to the next. Um, but if we take the... Um, if we take the three things, right? Because I guess you could say there are three things. It's glory and it's fall and the return of the kings of men to Middle-earth, right? We got the glory and the kings of men. And then sandwiched between them, we have the allusion to their fall, right? Um, yeah. Rinroos, that's why I found it so striking. Um and it was, I was talking, I talked about this during um, our Sauron Defeated class when I was, when, I, when we were going through that, that for me, going through Sauron Defeated, uh, which meant both the Notion Club papers and then uh, the drowning of Anadune uh, immediately afterwards, the experience, Rinroos, that I was continuing to have throughout that discussion was um, reorienting myself, because that's exactly how I had always dominantly seen them. I mean, I, 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 what I took from the Lord of the Rings, certainly as a kid, was that the Numenorians are the faithful ones, right? The Numenorian, like the, 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 Ar the Arnorian and Gondorian uh, Numenorians were the good guys, right? And maybe they weren't totally innocent of the fall of Numenor, you know, but like they were um, the ones who were being rewarded, Right. For their faithfulness by their survival. Um, 
But Rinrus, that's what was so, I mean, it was very striking to me uh, last year when we were reading through it was how powerfully uh, Tolkien is emphasizing um, they feel themselves to be lost. They feel themselves to be exiled. Numenor has been taken for them, and here they are on the shores of Middle-earth, staring off to the west, having lost their link back to, you know, having had the door of the west slammed in their faces, and having their home taken away from them. And whatever they set up in Middle-earth, you know, the kingdoms that Elrond is going to go on to describe, were not just second best, right? They were um, they were, I don't know what, makeshift, not even really, um, uh, yeah, nothing like a substitute, right? Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so Fourth Dauntless asks, can we combine this vague synopsis plus the issue uh, of what happened to the ring when Sauron was in exile from last week to assume that Tolkien hadn't yet fleshed out that story in his mind? Yes, definitely. Definitely. I mean, so that Sauron was the villain of the Numenor story was true well before. Like, that was introduced in the Lost Road period, um, which was which was earlier, which was before the publication of The Hobbit. Um, uh, not before the writing of The Hobbit, but before the publication of The Hobbit. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Rinrus, I don't know if I can quite convey it to you without uh, the passages and the laments uh, uh, of, uh, of the Numenorians and that, that experience of they are not... Um, they do not feel themselves to be lifted by the hands of the Valar and preserved in safety to Middle-earth. They are pushed before the wind of the wrath uh, of Iluvatar and the Valar. Um, they are expelled from Numenor with a mighty hand, is how they feel about it. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, no, it's it's. I guess I, I I can't do full justice to it now. In summary, uh, I I it, I do recommend the Sauron defeated class. Probably probably a good idea. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Anyway, so but for Thoughtless, you're absolutely right. I I think it, it is pretty clear that the Numenor star story is. Um, not yet fully developed in Tolkien's mind, which is why I'm really interested to see what we get of it, right? And what role that story plays in this story as it unfolds, right? And right now, what Numenor is providing to this story and what we're seeing in this sentence is a backdrop of myth, right? That is... There are some, there, there are still among us, the descendants of the great ones, the kings of men who returned to Middle Earth out of the deeps of the sea, as if they rose up like gods out of the ocean, right? That's not what happened. Um, and that's not even what Tolkien means happens. But again, that sentence, that phrasing of the sentence almost sounds like that, right? Like they're rising, um, you know, like Neptune from the depths or something, right? It's, it's, um, it's kind of amazing. Um, but um, anyway, so that kind of mythic power of the Numenor story seems to be the, the dominant emphasis here, though don't forget that he does have nestled in the midst of alluding to their awesomeness, their fall, right? The fall of Numenor. Um, there's at least tragedy there and probably sin, right? Um, then Elendil the Tall and his mighty sons, Isildur and Anarion, became great lords, and the north realm they made in Arnor, and the south realm in Gondor, above the mouths of the Anduin. But Sauron of Mordor assailed them. Um. Oh man, Flamifras, do I think the Numenor story was ever fully developed in Tolkien's mind, or would he have revised it? I don't think any story was ever fully formed in Tolkien's mind. Um because he felt that the stories were living things, you know, that he was only tending and discovering. Um, uh, so yeah, no, I don't think it, it was ever fully developed in Tolkien's mind. Um, but anyway, um, 
one of the things that strikes me about this sentence and the next one, frankly, um, notice how it sounds like they're doing this all by themselves, right? Again, the greatness of the kings of men, right? Elendil the Tall and his mighty sons, Isildur and Anarion, they became great lords. And what did they do? Uh, they made the North Realm in Arnor and the South Realm in Gondor above the mouths of the Anduin. So the three of them, the three of them made these two kingdoms, right? They established these kingdoms. They are the kings of men returning to Middle Earth. And apparently their kingship was acknowledged, recognized by many of the peoples of Middle Earth, right? Um, it's not a nation of people that come from Numenor, right? Um, that come and, and, uh, and take over. They arrive, these kings arrive, and they are accepted as kings. That seems to be the implication, right? Um, this is not, you know, uh, yeah, the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor are not peopled by Numenorians. They are ruled by Numenorians, right? I guess it's, it's like the three of them are, do, are doing all these things, but Sauron of Mordor assailed them, the kingdoms, you know, but also like the three of them, Elendil, Isildur, and Anarion, right? Uh, versus Sauron. So they made the last alliance of elves and men and the hosts of Gilgalad and Elendil were mustered in Arnor. This is the first allusion to Elendil not just being on his own. He's, he, he does have an army, it turns out. Um, uh, yeah, so yes, they, Turambar, they made, um, they made the alliance. Um, presumably, Elendil and his sons made the alliance. So it seems to be initiated by them, right? Um, Yeah, exactly. Um, JJ, this is similar to Thorin returning to the mountain, and I, I think it's a really important point to keep in mind when we read The Hobbit. Um, uh, a king is he who can hold his own, says Durambar of many names. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, you are absolutely right, um, uh, Praise Moyer, that it, j people have to follow you. Right. You're just a madman, as you say, if you just, go, you know, <laughs> um, uh, you know, you can't just call yourself a king. Right. Um, uh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I didn't vote for you. Exactly. Yeah. Because uh, when you don't want to create a self-perpetuating autocracy. Um Anyhow, <laughs> exactly. I, unsurprisingly, several of your minds are going in exactly the same directions that uh, that mine were. Notice, by the way, this is a thing that happens a lot in Tolkien's world. You guys were talking about Thorin and Erebor and how this happened, right? But there's more than that, right? Um. Think of the way this works among the... Think of Galadriel, right? Here's Galadriel and Celeborn, who come and among the Sindar. Or, I'm sorry, not among the Sindar, among the Nandor, right? And rule a kingdom of the Nandor. Think about, about Legolas, right? And Thranduil, who are Sindar, ruling a realm of the Nandor, right? Um, this is what happens, right? This happens a lot in Tolkien, that... Someone comes from outside and is brought in and accepted. Even Melian, Kurtzimus, I think you can say that. Sure, sure. Um, uh, I would also point out, and not to belabor the point, but this was a this was a a mythic shape that he was explicitly very interested in. Tolkien was in Sauron defeated. Um, the, the the dominant theme of those later Numenorean stories um, are about like the the 
the Numenorean heritage through like Anglo-Saxon and Gothic times and things like that. Um, so he was writing lots of, uh, you know, fake texts in Anglo-Saxon, which demonstrated the survival of Numenorean myths within the Anglo-Saxon period and things like that. And of course, Turambar, that's exactly the kinds of thing that he was, um, that he was thinking about shield chafing. Um, King, uh, King Horn, uh, is, uh, you know, the, the, prose oh shoot i'm forgetting whether the prose or the poetic version of king horn was written we just did this like four months ago and i've forgotten already which one was written at the at that time you know after this right after this but yes this idea of this like numenorean foundling who um uh is acclaimed as king and becomes basically just like it's modeled on shield chafing um anyway so that's that's the model that we have here, which means this is the, so let me get back to a question. Somebody was asking just a little while ago. Um, Crownless was asking, what is Elrond's purpose in building up Numenor? Like why all the pro Numenor propaganda in this speech? Is he shoring up Aragorn in some way? Well, I wouldn't say shoring up in the sense that like, you know, he's got to prop up Aragorn. If Aragorn is going to get any respect from anybody, I, I, I don't, I can't see that motivation necessarily being enforced there. Um, but what I can see is the establishment of the parallel, right? Because of course, that's exactly what's going to happen in the return of the king, right? Aragorn, the Numenorean, is going to, you know, the, the Numenorean, to say, he is, he's not just, you know, the heir to the old king, the long lost heir. He is the long lost heir, but he's not just the long lost heir, right? He is, once again, we have the return of the kings of men to Middle Earth. Not out of the deeps of the sea this time, right? But out of the sketchy north. Um, So... Yeah, I do think that he is, um, Elrond is, that is, pointing to the parallel. So is he shoring up Aragorn? No, he's not trying to build his case. Is he perhaps trying to lay the f f groundwork so that Boromir is prepared to contextualize the revelation that is coming and which he, Elrond, knows is coming, um, Elrond is going to be at least as aware as anyone in the room of the challenging situation that is about to happen, right? Uh, he knows who Boromir is, right? And although he's downplayed it in his introduction, he knows who Boromir is. He knows the significance of what's about to happen here, right? Um, the fact that Aragorn is the heir of Isildur and that he's going to return to Minas Tirith and, if all goes well, claim the kingship, that's important news, right? And if there is any human being in Middle-earth who is likely to be displeased to hear this news, it's Boromir, right? Denethor, yeah, but I'd count him behind Boromir, actually. Um... Uh, again, as far as potential, like, Elrond has got to be anticipating. This could go badly, <laughs> very, very badly, if I'm not careful. So I do suspect that one of the reasons that he's doing the Numenorean story um, uh, here and, and emphasizing it in this way is that he's preparing the way uh, for the revelation of Aragorn's lineage that's going to happen Uh afterwards um let's see so fourth thoughtless says we could also take this as evidence that is the pumping up of numenor as evidence that the passage was uh, written or edited by Findigil king's scribe um yes it's possible but it doesn't sound like his tone eh, a little bit maybe maybe I could buy it. I could buy it. Um, like, so the idea, right, would be what Frodo wrote was um, like of Numenor, he spoke, you know, and uh, like. Um, uh, 
I think that he would have to say most of those things, paraphrasing the history in order to get us to the to the modern day. Um, if Findegill has a hand in it, I think it would have to be in the wording. Maybe the return of the kings of men to Middle Earth out of the deeps of the sea is Findegill. Um, maybe like the mighty sons thing, right? Um, uh, you know, maybe Frodo just wrote, uh, then Elendil and his sons Isildur and Inarion uh, established the North Realm in Gondor and the South uh, the, in Arnor and the South Realm in Gondor above the mouths of the Anduin. Um, and, you know, it got uh, amped up a little bit by Findegil, King's writer. That's possible. I mean, it's conceivable that that happened. I don't feel like that's necessary. The times when we have suggested Findegillian intervention in the text have been where there seems to be a real shift, where a, this one sentence is just tonally in a totally different place. Like that moment with Arwen. Remember that description of Arwen's sentence that we were feeling fairly confident was Findegill pitching in, right? Um, this doesn't feel that way. This seems to be in keeping with the, the, the spirit of the summary that we've been, um, that we've been receiving, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah. So Tim Delph, Findegill would be after Frodo. So remember, so Findegill King's writer makes a copy of the red book after, uh, Pippin brings it to Minas Tirith. Right. Um, so, so yeah, it would be, um, uh, his, his, his would be the latest. So the full text, Frodo's already gone. Frodo's, Frodo's not even in Middle Earth anymore. Uh, when Findegill King's writer, uh, comes at it. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Matt says he wrote earlier about how the Kings of Men returning line will justify Aragorn's wars of conquest following the War of the Ring, justifying the, the disposing of the lesser illegitimate Kings who swore fealty, uh, to Sauron. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah. Um, Arden Cran says if events hadn't brought him to Gondor, would Aragorn have planned to eventually introduce himself as the heir? Yeah. I mean, he's, uh, well, okay. I guess it depends on what you mean. If events hadn't brought him into Gondor, if by that you mean if the ring had not been found and the war of the ring begun, would he have done it? No, just like his dad didn't do it and his granddad didn't do it and his granddad didn't do it and his granddad didn't do it. They were all the heirs of Elendil and knew it, right? But none of them made a move. So there have been a lot of chieftains of the Dúnedain in the years since the throne of Gondor has been empty and not a single one of them came forward. Right. No, no, no. Not Arvedui. He was king of Arnor. I mean, chieftains of the Dúnedain. Right. Roughing it in the woods after the fall of Arnor. Right. None of them did that. None of them came forward. Why, Tim? Because the time was not right. Um, remember that it was spoken of old. I say remember. We've not gotten to the passage yet. It will come later in this chapter. That it was spoken of old that the sword of Elendil should be reforged when... Isildur's bane is revealed, right? They have what appears to be a um, a family tradition, right? Pre presumably informed by the wise uh, that the restoration of the kingship in Gondor, the restoration of the line of Elendil is tied to the fate of the ring and should wait. It is not, the time is not right. For them to reveal themselves yet. So, so if that is the question, would Aragorn have done it had everything remained quiet? No, he certainly wouldn't have. Again, any more than Arathorn did. Um, had he not ended up in Gondor? Yes, I mean we know he was. Had Gandalf not fallen in Moria, right? And you know, Aragorn is going to say later on in the Fellowship of the Ring, that his plan was to go to Borom, go with Boromir to Minas Tirith, right? When he leaves, um, when he leaves Rivendell, Minas Tirith is his destination. That's his plan from the beginning, because he believes that the, the dream uh, is a sign and a summons to him that the time is right, the sword is reforged, it's time to go, right? So he is on his way to Minas Tirith. Um, 
But of course, he ends up getting there in a strange way. But yes, yes, exactly. Um, uh, yes, you're right. It, Aragorn doesn't say it in direct uh, dialogue. The narrator tells us that Aragorn, that it was Aragorn's plan. But um, um, but yeah, yeah, we uh, we know that this um, um, that this happens. Green Great Dragon says, would Throngil have happened if Bilbo hadn't found the ring? Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, yeah, no problem. Again, he didn't reveal himself. He didn't claim anything, right? Um, he just was helping out. I would not be a bit surprised to find that he was not the only one of the chieftains uh, of the Dúnedain who had also gone down and in disguise contributed to the history of Gondor. Um, okay. Anyway, um, cool. Where are we? Paragraph one still. <laughs> okay. Whew. All right. The last alliance of elves and men attributed to Elendil, Isildur, and Anarion, they made the last alliance of elves and men and the hosts of Gilgalad and Elendil were mustered in Arnor. Um, uh, yeah. Um, notice what that suggests. Again, just the fact that Elrond is crediting Elendil and his sons with initiating the Last Alliance. Um... That means that, you know, the last march of the elves here, um, you know, this last alliance is a response by the elves. This is an act of, I don't know if obedience is quite exactly right, kind of obedience, sacrifice, right? Um, yeah, no, no, the point isn't that it was a completely unilateral alliance to Urambar. The elves agreed, right? But the point is that it was Elendil who initiated it, right? He came to them and proposed the alliance. They didn't go to him. So this was not the question of, Elend of Gilgalad recruiting Elendil to assist him. It was the other way around. Um, and that strikes me as significant, um, as quite significant, because the elves who are still remaining in Middle-earth, they're just, they're a small group remaining, right? Um, they know that their time is passing, um, but they respond to the call of Elendil and his people. They acknowledge this is, this is the time, right? This is when this should happen. Um, uh, yeah. And yes, you're right, Luke, that they are kin from afar, Right. Um, so it's it's this is not like them. My, my argument is not that Gilgalad deserves props for, you know, putting it out there, even though he was just asked by this random dude. Right. Elendo is in all ways not a random dude. Right. Um, he, who he was coming from Numenor, uh, the Numenorean relationship with the elves, uh, the, um, the distant relationship between uh Elendil and, um, you know, Elrond himself, um, all those things are relevant in everything. But again, my point is simply, this is not the elves war against Sauron in which the Numenorians assisted them. This is the Numenorians war against Sauron in which the elves came to their aid. And that I think is an important context to keep in mind here and also helps us to understand the emphasis on Arnor and Gondor that the narrator is is laying right or that Elrond as as storyteller here is laying here and in the next few passages as he continues forward right um uh yeah yeah um and yes you're right that uh Flamifer, that uh Arnor would be the logical place uh for Elendil and Gilgalad to 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 muster um because they are, that's where they're located. They're both up, uh, you know, in the Northwest up there. Um, 
You will remember that we've already been told by Aragorn, uh, or Strider perhaps I should even say, uh, that Elendil stood on Weathertop waiting for Gilgalad to come out of the West, right? Um, so they met in Arnor, but they met in the very southeastern corner of, uh, of Arnor, essentially, right? Um, so, um, anyhow, that's, um, uh, makes a certain kind of sense that the men were spread all through this area. The elves were located to the west of them, out by the coast. Um, they got together here, and from here, from Weathertop, Right, they marched together uh, down to Daggerlad. So, the final crossing of Eriador and the crossing of the mountains, uh, presumably, I assume, through the Gap of Rohan, um, is uh, was done together. Gilgalad and Elendil moving together. Um, okay. Now we have Elrond's retrospective moment. Oh, Kurtzimus, there aren't so many Numenorians. There aren't. That's the point. There's a few Numenorians. These are mostly other people that have taken them as kings um, within the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor, which are like, I don't even know what percentage, 98% non-Numenorian stock? Um, that's, that's, uh, that's where it is. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Elrond's retrospective. That's where we were. I remember well the splendor of their banners. It recalled to me the glory of the Elder Days and the hosts of Beleriand. So many great princes and captains were assembled. And yet not so many, nor so fair as when Thangorodrum was broken, and the elves deemed that evil was ended forever. And it was not so. Okay, this is, um... tricky, right? This is complicated, what he says here. Um... Yeah, Mad Violinist, I've always been tempted to read this speech that way. Mad Violinist says, back in my day, right? And it, it begins in that um, it seems to begin in that line, right? Um, like, is Elrond just bragging here, right? Is Elrond just building himself up uh, by being like, oh, needless to say, I was an eyewitness to these things. I was part of that army, right? In fact, <clears throat> don't want to boast, but I was the herald of Gilgalad myself. And, you know, um, like it's, it could be building himself up, right? Um, like this, what would appear to be sort of egregious going out of his way to like name drop basically. Right. Um, to, uh, to insert himself, um, into the narrative. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's, 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 um, interesting. Right. I mean, it seems out of his way to do this. Um, <laughs> okay, Boomer, <laughs> says d <-Mate. laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but the interesting thing is that although the very beginning sounds that way, I remember well the splendor of their banners, right? Sounds exactly like that tone, right? But at the same time, immediately afterwards, right? Immediately afterwards, he undermines it, right? On a couple different levels. Notice the first gesture that he makes. So he's just been building up the last alliance of elves and men, right? He's been building up El Elendil the Tall and his mighty sons and, and uh, the hosts of Gilgalad and Elendil, right? And he says, I remember well the splendor of their banners, right? That was pretty awesome. Right. Uh, the, the, the armies of, El of El Lendl and Gilgalad, that was a sight. Right. But he's not just building up his own importance by pointing out that he was there. Right. He only brings it up so as to say it recalled to me the glory of the elder days and the hosts of Beleriand. 
so many great princes and captains were assembled, right? How, how, how great was the army of Elendil and Gilgalad, Elrond? So great that it, like, it was like a distant memory even of the armies back in the Elder Days, right? So the first thing he does when having this retrospective moment about the armies is diminish them, point out indirectly, although they were great, they were very, very much lesser than the armies that came before that, the armies of the age before, of the Elder Days and the hosts of Beleriand. Um, it was so great that it recalled those even greater armies. Um, uh, so the, the, so as he's doing his apparently self-aggrandizing retrospective, what we see him doing is not building it up, right? Oh, I mean, he could do, he could totally do that. It's the last alliance, right? He's got every reason he could do that. He could be all like, but the last, the, let me tell you, my friends, the army of the last alliance of elves and men is an army like, the like of which will never be seen again on this earth, right? Boy, let me tell you, compared to modern armies, they are so lame compared to the armies of the last alliance. Don't even get me started, right, on the, on the, on the armies of the last alliance. Um, he could totally have done that, right? But he doesn't do that. Instead, he diminishes them, right? Um, they were awesome, but they were only a, 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 a pale shadow, right? They were only a, a, a faint recollection of the greatness and the glory of the armies of the hosts of Beleriand in the Elder Days, right? Um, and then, of course, as several of you were our... Uh, pointing out, he goes on to undermine it even further. And yet not so many, nor so fair, as when Thangarodrum was broken, and the elves deemed that evil was ended forever, and it was not so. Right? Okay, so having... having bragged about being there and seeing the Last Alliance, not to name drop or anything, he then seems to double down. Right? Um, by... So, so first he, uh, he, he says, oh, it wasn't that great though. I mean, it was awesome, but it was so awesome that it recalled that greater army. And then he's all like, and did I mention like, um, I totally was there too. Right. Yeah. Host of Valerian, been there, done that. Right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I go back way, I go way back, man. There's, there isn't a glorious host I've not seen. Let's just be honest about that. Right. Um, so it kind of seems like so was Elrond alive for the fall of Thangarodrim? Yes. Yes, he was. He was there. He was he was um, he was, uh, you know, not didn't play a big role. You know, he was like uh, still an elvish teenager at the time, functionally speaking. Um, but. Um, yeah. Anyway, the point that he's going on to make, though, is not, he's not just building himself up more and more, even though it may kind of sound like it, right? You know, Elrond trying to establish himself as the as the oldest of OG, you know, members of like you know the the glorious battle brigade. Um, that's not his point. He finally comes to his point at the end of that paragraph, and the elves deemed that evil was ended forever, and it was not so, right? What he's the whole point of his retrospective is I can tell you the end of the story, right? I was there at the Battle of the Last Alliance. There is no way that our modern armies, we could possibly get together a military force that would rival the armies of the Last Alliance. Trust me, right? Um, and they took down Sauron, but as we can see, it wasn't a permanent fix. That's kind of what, what we're all here talking about is the non-permanence of the fix. That was the battle of the last Alliance, right? Um, they in turn were only a shadow of the glory of the elder days and the host of Beleriand, right? When Thangarodrum itself was broken and Sauron's boss was taken down. And at that time, the elves deemed that evil was ended forever, but it wasn't. So this is the pattern. Right. That I'm that I 
with the super long memory, right, and pointing out to you, howsoever glorious the armies, even if we were to put together like the best military alliance that the Third Age has to offer here, it's not going to work, right? Because we won't be as great as the last alliance, which didn't do the job, and they weren't as great as the hosts of Beleriand, which didn't do the job, right? You can't destroy evil like that. Um, yeah, and Matt, you're right. I do think he is, in a sense, doing the opposite of building himself up. Again, it's it's easy to kind of tease Elrond here, um, but I don't think that he is building himself up in the end. What he is doing is saying, essentially, look, take it from me. Let me head off any idea that military force is going to be the answer to this problem. Right? Sauron is back. Sauron is searching for the ring. I can tell you in advance that there is one solution that we should just push off the table from the beginning, right? Let's not even go there. And that is, let's build together a really big army and hope that we can win. Because that doesn't work. Not because you won't win, right? And, and of course, it's significant that he points to the two armies which did succeed, right? He doesn't talk about, like, the New Nyth Arnoidiad or something, right, where they lost horribly and everybody was slaughtered, right? Instead, he talks about the two most glorious, most successful battles, certainly in his living memory, but, um, you know, like, the, the great victory of the First Age and the great victory uh, of the Second Age, right? Um, and points out that neither of them won, Neither of them worked. So that even if here at the end of the Third Age we could achieve something like what they achieved, it wouldn't be enough. JJ, exactly it. So Boromir, before you ask, yes, is that, that seems to me exactly um, what he is emphasizing here. Um, it is possible for Thoughtless that he's also trying to attempt to head off the danger of trying to use the ring. That is possible. That is possible. Um, I don't... I don't see a very clear direct link. Again, I think it's conceivable. But I think that it's more likely that he is wanting to make it... And so I think that's why he pauses here. Right? That's why he pauses here to um, uh, to do this, um, this retrospective. Right? And to insert himself into his narrative at this point. Um... Not to glamorize himself, but to say, look, you've got to take this from me, right? If anybody knows both the capabilities and the limitations of military action, it's me. I've seen them both. I have seen the two greatest, most successful, most glorious battles literally in the history of Middle-earth. And I can tell you, it's even if it succeeds, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, so then we get Frodo's interruption you remember said Frodo speaking his thought aloud in his astonishment but I thought he stammered as Elrond turned towards him I thought the, the fall of Gilgalad was a long age ago Frodo's naivety here might seem kind of surprising, right? I think it's really important. This, I think, if we take it right, can really help to orient us in our understanding of the text. Because sometimes I think we can get too comfortable. Like, those of us who have read The Lord of the Rings you know, dozens of times over many years. We've kind of lived in this world in some ways, right? Like we've lived with it in any case. Um, it has become familiar to us. So we know these things. We know these things like trivia. We even know these things on a kind of deeper level, like the idea that Elrond, who is standing here uh, in the same room with Frodo as this scene is unfolding, is the same dude who has been on Middle-earth for thousands of years and has seen all these things. This is, um, uh, that, that's, it, it's a concept in the abstract that we're, that we become comfortable with, right? Okay. Yeah. Naturally. 
right? Elves are immortal, so he's been there. No big deal, right? Um, but Lincoln, it's exactly that. Just because he realizes Elrond's age intellectually doesn't mean that he really understands it, right? Um, even think about the way that Elrond is talked about, right? You know, the guy who runs the last homely house, Elrond, the great lore master, right? It's one thing to be a lore master, and it's another thing to be an eyewitness to events 3,000 years ago, right? That's totally different. Um, yeah, and Kurtzimus, yeah, exactly, saying, somebody saying, I, I, I remember when Jesus walked the earth would be shocking, right? But remember from Elrond's point of view, um, you know, Jesus walking the earth would have been later than his midlife crisis, right? I mean, like, that's only 2,000 years ago. Uh, you know, he's more than 6,000 years old. Um, so, absolutely. Um, uh, it would be like meeting someone who witnessed the siege of Troy, Fourth Dauntless, absolutely. Again, it's one thing to say, I know that elves live forever. It's another thing to really to, to have it borne in upon you that you are sitting next to somebody who met Achilles, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's like, I, that's, um, that's, uh, but, and I, I love the examples you guys are giving someone who witnessed the, 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 the fall of Troy, uh, somebody who can remember when the Epic of Gilgamesh was written, somebody who helped build the pyramids, right? Absolutely. Uh, all of those things. Um, are perfectly apt. And, and that's just to the Battle of the Last Alliance, keep in mind, right? Then we go back as far beyond that again, right? You know, I mean, so, so like in terms of our human history, right? Here's here's Elrond being like, ah, oh, the Fertile Crescent. That was kind of nice, right? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, it's, it's exactly someone who was there when Sumer fell. Yes, yes. Um, uh, right. Kursima says, yeah, Thark was kind of cool. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it really boggles the imagination. Um, and that's what's happening to Frodo. His imagination is being boggled. Right. Uh, as he hears about this, like that, just hearing somebody recollect about the battle of the last Alliance, um, to really, um, uh, to, to really, uh, acknowledge the fact that like, again, like this dude was actually there. Um, it's, he's stammering, right? Um, and his statement, I thought that the fall of Gilgalad was a long age ago is kind of lame. I think it's supposed to be kind of lame because he's, it's awkward, right? He's having this awkward where he's like, he's so shocked at the thought of this, that he is, um, that he says this aloud. Right. Um, he accidentally vocalizes this. Um, this is where it's really, as I say, when we become comfortable with this, when we live with Tolkien's world for years and we we kind of think about it from the outside, we can lose our perspective like this. Frodo's reaction here is a really good reminder. This is not like um, uh, this is not like say, Ted Sandyman, right? If Ted Sandyman were sitting here, he'd be skeptical, right? Um, Fro think about the difference between Frodo and Ted Sandyman, right? Um, Frodo knows the history. Frodo believes the history. Frodo's been taught all of these things. Um, what little Ted Sandyman knows about the great stories and the ancient legends um, is not very much, and he doesn't believe very much of it anyway, but he... And Frodo's got the genuine scoop, right? I mean, he, he learned about this stuff from somebody who knew Elrond, who had met Elrond on several occasions. So, um, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, he is well oriented to all of these things. And yet he is still flummoxed by this. The hobbits still live in this very mortal world where the Shire Reckoning, right, 1,400 years ago, just seems almost impossibly remote, right? Um, and it's... Um, uh, it's... 
this moment of this reality being born in on him of what the, um, uh, of what the immortality of the elves means in general practice, right? Um, it's, it's an important moment. And this is what brought me to the idea of the paradox of middle earth history, because there are two things that we have to remember and they seem to push us in totally different directions. And I think that we as readers tend to be guilty of favoring the one over the other. That is reading the Lord of the Rings. There are two realities about history in middle earth that we should confront, right? One is the fact that there are surviving eyewitnesses. Like we don't, we wouldn't have had to have a whole debate about whether Troy actually existed, right? Let's just go ask Elrond cause he was there. Right. Um, if there were still living eyewitnesses who retained crystal clear memories of those times in those, you know, a, a lot of historical inquiry would be unnecessary. Right. Because we could just ask. Right. Um, so that's one reality about Middle Earth history is that to some extent there is a kind of potential access to ancient history in Middle Earth which has no parallel of any kind in our experience and in our primary world, right? There just are not any eyewitnesses who still live that we can talk to about these things. Um, so that's one reality. And it, and, but again, I, and this is the one that I think that we as Tolkien readers tend to favor unfairly because, and I think it's kind of natural that we should, I think that we sort of share um, Frodo's wonder here. And when we have that moment where we really wrap our minds around the fact that Elrond has been there the whole time that he saw all of these things himself. And then we think like, well, okay. So therefore, since there are living eyewitnesses who were there, Galadriel has been around that long. Elrond has been around that long. Cured in the shipwright has been around forever. Um, so old he's grown a beard. Um, the, uh, it's easy to start thinking. So therefore there are a few mysteries about the past, right? I mean, cause again, like we, we can know, just ask them, right? They were there. They can tell. So we don't have to speculate. We don't have to do all of the like generations of scholarship speculating about what really happened at the, you know, did Troy ever exist, uh, you know, or not, uh, we don't need like, who, who needs to try to figure that out? Just ask, right? Um, and we can be told, right? But here's the other side. So that's one fact about Middle Earth history, the existence of very long lived eyewitnesses. But here's the second fact about Middle Earth history. It's thousands and thousands of years of a dom of dominantly oral traditions. There aren't very many historians. There are almost no historians. And as far as we can tell, there are no archaeologists. So those people who were debating about whether or not Troy really existed, right, weren't even there, right? So I've often tried to say things, some like some of the things we were talking about, right? Um, think about like the ancient Egyptian kings and when we're thinking about, you know, why is it that the, the hobbits in the Shire have like forgotten almost everything about the war of the last Alliance and everything else? Like, why do they, what, why, why, why do they need briefing on this? Because it is to them separated by as much historical distance as the ancient Egyptian rulers were to us. But with this difference, we have more history. And we have more, like, that is, we have more written history to work with, and we have archaeology. Imagine how much you would know about the kings of ancient Egypt, right? You already might probably not know very much, right? But think how much less you would know if there were no historians and no archaeologists and never had been, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, I mean, would we even know that Egypt had ever been a thing? 
I mean, ancient Egypt. Uh, I mean, presumably there would be some, you know, rumors about like there would be the pyramids still existing. And so there would probably still exist stories in the modern world of what they were like. Right. Um, you know, exactly. Spiritual cushions. We would only have myths and legends then. Yeah. Um, there is almost no parallel to the kind of written histories that we get um, from, uh, like, Angrist from the Romans, right? Uh, Roman history about Egypt, there's almost no parallel to that, right? You can say, well, Gondor is a parallel, except it's not. There are several ways in which Gondor is not like Rome in that first because, again, even there, there is very little direct evidence that the Gondorian uh, historical tradition, like that they had that kind of, Are there Gondorian historians who f study other societies? I mean, they do have libraries where they keep lore records about themselves, about the history of Gondor. And that's something that's unusual. Um, if you go to the to the library of Minas Tirith, like if you tagged along with Gandalf and while he was searching for scrolls about Isildur, you went and browsed the rest of the sections, what are you going to find? Are you going to find the ancient history of the Dunlendings, say? Say you're interested in Dunlending history, right? And you go to the... Are you going to... Are you going to find anything like that? I don't think you are. I think it's unlikely, right? I think it's unlikely. The other reason that it's unlike Rome, is that it did not conquer the whole <laughs> world, right? Um, Roman historical influence uh, spread as it did because Rome spread, right? Gondor was powerful and ruled a wide realm, but they weren't expansionist, right? The whole rest of Rovanian and Eriador just kind of hung out, right? Um so there's, again, there's, there's little contact there. There's no reason to think that Dunlending practices have been influenced by Gondorian historical practices in the way that, say, uh, you know, uh, German practices are influenced by Roman historical practices, right? So that, you know, the Germans of our Middle Ages, right, are very much operating under the influence of, of the cultural influence of Rome, right? Holy Roman Empire and all that, right? Um, we don't get that with the rest of, um, uh, you know, the, 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 most of the rest of Ariador and Ravani. Anyway, my point is simply um, the level of true, the ignorance of true history is, I think, far more profound in across the very vast majority of everybody who lives in Middle Earth than we can even really imagine. I think it's hard for us to imagine it, how little we would know. I saw somebody comparing it to our Middle Ages, and I deny that. The Middle Ages knew a lot because they had all of the Roman writings, right? Um, I mean, not all of them, but they had many of the Roman writings. They knew a lot of history, and they, got a, they, had, they, they had lost most of their Greek, right? So there was a lot of history that they didn't have and didn't know and didn't rediscover until later on, but they had a lot. And what's more, they had traditions about writing things and researching things and thinking about things, um, you know, that... that, that um, uh, that there's no evidence anybody in Middle Earth had, um, other than perhaps some people in Gondor. Um, so um, anyway, it's just uh, I. So yes, even even throughout the Middle Ages, even throughout you know uh, the Western Middle Ages, um, as far as I can see, the Western Middle Ages still had uh, a, a historical awareness and a tradition of history that Middle Earth has no glimmer of. Most of the people in Middle Earth have no glimmer of, have no memory of. Think of the Rohirrim, right? Their history goes back to what? Errol the Young. Prior to that, a few legends and stories, right? There was a dragon, right? 
somebody did something with Scoth of the Worm and brought a horn back, right? Um, but yeah, so I mean, you've got you've got legends of people like Fram who killed Scoth of the Worm, but um, but I mean, five hundred years, five hundred years. So they've gone one sixth of their history goes back one sixth of the way. The reliable history goes back one sixth of the way, even to the Battle of the Last Alliance. Forget anything before that, right? Like the War of the Rings of Power, for instance. Um, so um, anyway, it's um, very remarkable, very remarkable. And so again, therefore, I get so just as we often, I think, as readers, kind of get um, uh, too comfortable with um, uh, with elves and the idea of immortality, and we can kind of forget uh, how wondrous this is when it, when when a, a mortal really encounters it for the first time. Um, I think too that again we just we assume so much because the hist we have so much history of Middle Earth, right? We've got the appendices, we've got the Silmarillion, we've got unfinished tales, and all these other things, and so it's easy for us to associate Middle Earth with carefully chronicled history in general, right? And that is absolutely not the case. And yet, in the midst of what is going to be a very broad ignorance of history, um, it's... Um, Sorry, I could <laughs> my, my phone is pitching in. Um, uh, in the midst of this, we have these few examples of people like Elrond who can remember right um in their isolated and indeed hidden kingdoms right where you can go and uh and uh and ask them um yeah yeah um yeah <laughs> <laughs> Several of you are typing in suggested uh, 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 commands for Siri there. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, and I agree. And, and so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to overplay it, uh, Flamifer. You're, there, is, there is legend, right? Legends still exist. Um, Butterbur has heard of the old kings, right? That's a phrase that means something to him. Right. There do still exist stories, stories in circulation, which, of course, is exactly what you would expect when there are individual people who do keep those memories. Right. And cultures, isolated cultures like the Dunedain in the north, like Gondor in the south, like, you know, like Minas Tirith in the south, where memory is kept alive of ancient things. Right. Um, though even in Gondor, lore is beginning to wane. So yes, legends circulate. Stories circulate. The name of Sauron is not unknown, even in the Shire, right? It still is a story that's told. Um, but, uh, but again, the, the thing that I'm chiefly responding to are those people who will read this and be like, how does everybody not know this is Sauron's ring of power right away? Like, isn't it the most obvious thing? I mean, like process of elimination, it couldn't be any other ring. And it's like, why is everybody playing dumb? This is a plot hole, right? That's the kind of thing that I'm, that I'm responding to, especially. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, Good. And I agree for Thoughtless that it is striking that it's Frodo and not Boromir who reacts with shock at Elrond's age. Boromir has more call than most, perhaps, certainly more call than more excuse than Frodo, you could say, to be shocked. Right. Because Frodo, at least, has been literally brought up on stories of Elrond from somebody who's met him. Right. Whereas to Boromir... They had to look up. I mean, they didn't even know what Imladris was, right? Um, it was only through his mastery of obscure books of lore that Denethor even knew the name, right? Um, so very few. But perhaps in that sense, actually, um, Boromir is better prepared because to him, Elrond and Imladris are names out of legend, right? Um and so he 
sort of is coming expecting to meet ancient legend, right? But I also do suspect Trifle that Boromir has a better council face uh, than Frodo does. I think it's very likely that Boromir um, is shocked, but I can very easily imagine that Boromir's reaction um, to everything that he's seeing and everybody that he's meeting here at this council is to play it cool, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. Let's see. Would Elrond's name be recalled? Luke is asking, um, as the brother of the, like the lines of the Numenorians that they come from. Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe, but it doesn't sound like it. Um, I mean, based on what we see. Um, yeah, it's also possible, Cecilia, of course, that Boromir just didn't have a chance to put his foot in his mouth and Frodo beat him to it. Um, that is that is possible. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, no, Lincoln, I do think it's his age that he's objecting to. Lincoln asks a very sensible question. Is it his age that Frodo is surprised about, or... Is he just sort of surprised? It's not a, like, you're that old, but rather a, dude, you knew Gilgalad, right? I mean, it's one thing to know he was around that long. It's another thing to know that, you know, he actually, like, played a role in these events, right? Um, but, yeah, JJ, exactly. Um, I thought that the fall of Gilgalad was a long age ago. It's the length of the age that he's emphasizing, so it does seem to be the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes. And Ambrosius Aurelianus, you are correct that uh, he says, I've learned you can save face. A, you can save face a lot just by being one of the quieter people at the big meeting. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're right. Kurtzum is, of course, Tom Bombadil is also that old, but he didn't hang out with Gogolad. Right. Um, he's too cool for Gogolad. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, it's true. But again, it's 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 the length of time that Frodo is uh, is not objecting to, but is uh, commenting upon here. Um, I'm making my can we do another slide face? Um, let me peek, just peek. The next slide. Yeah, let's do it quick. This will be fast. <laughs> so it was indeed, answered Elrond gravely. But my memory reaches back even to the Elder Days. Eärendil was my sire, who was born in Gondolin before its fall, and my mother was Elwing, daughter of Dior, son of Luthien of Doriath. I have seen three ages in the west of the world, and many defeats, and many fruitless victories. I was the herald of Gilgalad, and marched with his host. I was at the Battle of Dagorlad before the Black Gate of Mordor, where we had the mastery. For the spear of Gilgalad and the sword of Elendil, Iglos and Narsil, none could withstand. I beheld the last combat on the slopes of Oridruin, where Gilgalad died, and Elendil fell, and Narsil broke beneath him. But Sauron himself was overthrown and Isildur cut the ring from his hand with the hilt shard of his father's sword and took it for his own. Okay. Um, that first paragraph does sound like bragging again, right? But again, notice what he is setting up the whole time through, right? Um, my memory reaches back even to the Elder Days. Right. And then he talks about he, then he starts doing some very serious name dropping. Right. Um, but the, the whole point, what he is building up to is I have seen three ages in the West of the world and many defeats and many 
fruitless victories. Um, that's the point. That's the point that he gets to, right? Um, I, um, I've seen many defeats and many fruitless victories. Um, we don't have a chance to win is what he's gently getting around to. Right. Um, I think here again, Elrond, like he was before when talking about the, the uh, breaking of Thangorodrim, he is setting up the response to the proposals later on. Right. Um, so don't tell me we should get an army together and attack. It's not going to matter. It's not going to work. Right. Um, he's, um, yeah, even if we win by force, we ultimately lose. Yes. The victory is fruitless. Um, yeah, and you're right, Ambrosius Aurelianus. He's definitely not trying to put a bright shine on their situation here. Um, and he is, Catriana, I agree, uh, very gently telling them, you know, we're kind of screwed here, just so that you know, right? Um, he is certainly... You can't accuse him of uh, having a rose-tinted view of the situation. And he seems to be setting out to make sure that nobody else does either. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, yeah, so... Um, Yeah, <laughs> JJ says that Elrond could give Puddleglum lessons on taking a serious view of life. Yeah, so true, so true. Um, yeah, so fourth on this, I agree. Uh, this reads like Elrond already knowing what course of action will be needed, and he's setting up the council to draw that same conclusion. Yes, he's not he's not spilling anything yet, right? He's not he's not spoiling anything. He's um, but he is setting the stage. You will remember in the passage we haven't gotten to yet, people will start saying things that it sounds like folly. Um, he is going to he's going to make a suggestion. He has a course of action in mind. He is not just hosting the council. He's going to provide counsel with an E. Right. Um, he has advice he's going to give. Um, and he's going to be the one who's going to make the statement. We must send the ring to the fire, he is going to say. Right. And yes, I believe he knows that already. He has come to this council knowing that he is going to end up saying. We must send the ring to the fire. And so, yes, I do absolutely believe that he is setting that up here, that he wants to make sure they understand we are in a bad situation and there are no great options um uh we're not really going to win here um um brandon says you know i'm kind of impressed with how elrond is running this meeting he's not shouting we're doomed but he's not sh sugarcoating their bad situation yeah no and he is preparing them in active ways, and I think which will be fruitful ways for the decision that they have to make and the options that they actually have. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. I think he's doing a splendid job of running this meeting as well. Um, exactly. There is a doom that must be deemed and he uh, has a, you know, himself uh, a deeming of what it could be. Right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, notice where he segues from here. Right. Many defeats and many fruitless victories. So on that downer note, I was the herald of Gilgalad and marched with his host. I was at the Battle of Daggerlad before the Black Gate of Mordor, where we had the mastery. For the spear of Gilgalad and the sword of Elendil, Iglos and Narsil, none could withstand. I beheld the last combat on the slopes of Oridruin, where Gilgalad died, and Elendil fell, and Narsil broke beneath him. But Sauron himself was overthrown, 
and Isildur cut the ring from his hand with the hilt shard of his father's sword and took it for his own. First, he is setting up again, like, can we... Here's a question that would be sensible to ask, like for somebody to ask, right? As they're trying to figure out what to do, right? Somebody might ask, so, okay, what do we think it would actually take, right? Can we take Sauron or not, right? I mean, is it possible to take Sauron down? And Elrond is saying in advance, yep, yep, it's possible. He can, I, I've seen him go down. I saw it myself, right? But here's what it took. It took the sword of Elendil and the spear of Gogolad, right? Um, it took those two heroes, not to mention Isildur, right, to take him down. And, um, you know, Elendil and Gilgalad are not walking through that door, right? Um, uh, that's, that's, uh, so, so partly again, I think that he, he is saying Sauron is not unassailable. Notice there's hope in here. There's hope in this as well, right? He is saying, I've seen Sauron go down, right? Um, I, I've seen him bleed. I've seen it. It's totally doable, right? Sauron is not omnipotent. Sauron is not undefeatable. But at the same time, we no, we really uh, don't have the firepower here to uh, um, to take him down. Um, <laughs> I knew Elendo. I worked with Elendo and Senator. You're no Elendo. <laughs> it's something like that. Bricktails. Yeah. There's definitely there's definitely an element of that. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, in in the green eyes on uh, Twitch chat says. So you're saying there's a chance? Yeah. He is saying there's a chance. He is saying that there's a chance. Um, but um, uh. Yes, and you're right, Tim Delph. Absolutely. He is setting up with those eyes. I was the herald. I was at. I beheld. He is setting up his authority as an eyewitness, right? Like, like I, I am here to, I, I am, I am, a, I am an expert witness on Sauron's limitations, right? And I've seen him, I've seen him go down. Um, but, um, uh, but yes, yeah, so again, there's some hope here. He is not indestructible. He is not undefeatable. But look, this isn't um, this isn't going to go down, right? This is not really this 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 is not Plan A, right? Um, when Narsil broke beneath him, uh, beneath Elendil, um, but Sauron was overthrown, and Isildur cut the ring from his hand with the hilt shard of his father's sword and took it for his own. Some of you are wondering. How much Isildur contributed to this, right? Uh, did Isildur play a strong role in overthrowing Sauron, or did he just loot the corpse um, after Sauron was already taken down? Um, uh, <laughs> he gives all the praise. Elrond, Mr. Eyewitness, gives all the praise to um, Elendil and Gilgalad. Right. Um, Isildur was there and looted the corpse, <laughs> definitely looted the corpse. Um, but um, I, yeah, I, so I think that um, I, I don't know that Isildur is guilty of kill stealing exactly, uh, JJ, uh, but um, um but but yeah anyway um yeah i don't know it's a little bit inconclusive i mean certainly the the emphasis of his narrative is that the overthrow of sauron was accomplished by elendil and gogolad although it cost both of them their lives um he will say later that Isildur stood by his father. So 
if we wanted to paint a scenario in which Isildur was actually hiding behind a rock the entire time and then only came out after Sauron had fallen and looted his corpse, um, I, 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 um, um, that, that I think we, I think we do have evidence against that, that Isildur is definitely standing with his father here. Uh, uh, so I do think that he's involved, but I don't think that we need to imagine a scenario in which Sauron is fighting with Elendil and Gilgalad and he kills Gilgalad and he kills Elendil and then Isildur like leaps over his father's fallen body and like strikes the death blow against Sauron and, and then like cuts the ring from his finger. Um, I don't think that we need to imagine that scenario either. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Uh, yes. Um, so some of you are asking, was, as a Christmas was asking, so was Sauron a corpse at this point? And several of you are, um, uh, are, are mentioning this. Uh, I think the important thing Sauron himself was overthrown. The thing that I think is most important for us to realize is that Peter Jackson's wrong. <laughs> I don't mean just a harsh on the films, but the scenario that Peter Jackson dramatized is clearly exactly not what happened at the Battle of Daggerlad. Um, that is where Sauron was this unstoppable force had like mown down Gilgalad and Elendil and was about to do the same, was about to squash Isildur like a bug until Isildur got this like lucky strike in and uh, accidentally cut the ring from his finger and like undid the whole thing. That's not, that is exactly not what happened. Right. Um, Sauron is overthrown, right? He is. And after he is overthrown, Isildur cuts the ring from his hand. That's why I keep making jokes, jokes about looting his corpse. Does he actually have a, a, a decaying corpse? Um, you know, is his corpse cooling, uh, you know, uh, as, uh, as Isildur is cutting the ring from it? You know, uh, no. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that. I mean, his relationship with his physical body is not the same as most people's relationships with their physical body. So, um, you know, I don't think that we need... Uh, uh, understand him actually like lying there bleeding out on the you know, on on the stones, but he is first defeated and then the ring is struck from him. This is that's the important element here, right? That sequence is what's important. So what does it look like? You know, um, is he still crawling around? You know, is he trying to? You know, is is he? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. But what's important is while he had his ring, he was overthrown and then he, the ring was cut from him. And I do believe that um, that Sauron's physical body is all, is essentially destroyed at this moment. Um, and that that's part of what is happening when like, during those years in which he's like in his little retreat center at Dol Guldur. Right. He has to build his power back up again. Um, that's part of what's going on there. I think is that he, he remember, you know, it's Sauron's getting on in years, right? Like uh, rebuilding a physical body. Isn't like it was back in his early days. Right. Um, I, you know, like it was, um, it was, so how can Sauron be overthrown while he has the ring, Tim? Well, that is an excellent question. The answer is by awesomely powerful people. Sauron is not almighty. Even with his ring, he is not almighty. Remember, he felt that he could not take the elf lords one on one. He used he made the ring of power in order to give himself an advantage over them, which means he felt he needed an advantage over them. Remember, this is the guy who got schooled by, you know, that famous elf girl and her dog. Right. Um, a, one of the you know, the hound of Valinor once almost ripped out his throat. Right. So he and yes, exactly. Turambar, even Morgoth was wounded in a duel with an elf lord. Right. Um, uh, 
So anyway, and yes, yeah, Sauron does have a history of losing one-on-one -on -one fights. Um, Sauron made the Ring of Power to give himself an advantage, and again, presumably, he thought he needed an advantage. And he was right. Even with his ring, he was overcome. He was defeated because Elendil and Gogolad are that awesome, right? But again, their like is not on the earth now, right? That was the last alliance for several different kinds of reasons, right? Um, so it's impossible now. Like, so when you hear them saying that, like, if Sauron gets the ring, it's over, right? It's over because Elendil and Gilgalad aren't coming back. There isn't anybody. There is nobody currently in Middle Earth who has the power to overthrow Sauron that way again. Um, and if you think about it, think about Sauron's overall career, right? Forget the, the Ring of Power stuff for a second. Think of three the three different confrontations, right? Think of Sauron versus Arpharazon, right? Sauron versus Ar the Numenorians show up, call Sauron out, and he comes on his knees, right? He knows they're going to absolutely destroy his, his armies run away, right? Um, he cannot take our Pharazon, um, and the Numenorians, right? So in that confrontation, he, he doesn't even fight. He gives he surrenders. Now, yes, he's being wily, and yes, he has a plan B, but his plan A would have been to hold his his his, his title by force, um, and he can't do it, right? Number two, and I'm not even going back to the Silmarillion stuff, just thinking of the Middle-earth stuff, right? Conflict with the Numenorians, Battle of the Last Alliance, and then the War of the Ring at the end of the Third Age, right? The first one, he surrenders, because his opponents are way stronger than he is. Even though, remember, Tim, he has the Ring of Power then. Retroactively, right? A um, little retconning on Tolkien's part there. But still, like, Sauron, at the peak of his power, surrenders to the Numenorians because he can't measure up. Secondly, Battle of the Last Alliance. Long fight. Tough, right? Could go either way. Finally, he's taken down, though he... Um, um, though he... Um, uh, is able to take down Elendil and Gilgalad himself, right? So he kills them, but they kill him, and then he, he gets his ring taken away, so he is overcome. It's much harder the second time. It's nothing like the first time where he just surrenders because he can't possibly manage it. The third time, he is so strong that they can't possibly measure up. They know. If Sauron gets the ring at the end of the, you know, in the War of the Ring, if Sauron gets the ring, a second darkness is descending on the land. That's it. They're, they're done. It's over. Why? Because Sauron is getting stronger? No, because everybody else is getting weaker, right? The Battle of the Last Alliance was awesome, but they weren't nearly as awesome as our Pharazon and the Numenorians. I mean, come on, right? And the War of the Last, the War of the Ring is hopeless if he gets the ring because they are nothing like the War of the Last Alliance, right? Everything else is declining. Um, uh, but Sauron and Sauron is declining too, but not as fast right, as the rest of the world. Uh, Bricktails asked, did he surrender because he thought he would lose or simply as a strategy to get to Numenor and destroy it from the inside? Definitely the former. Definitely because he didn't think he was going to lose. He had lost. His army runs away when the Numenorians show up. He cannot beat the Numenorians. Now, he's all about making the lemonade. Right. Out of that kind of a situation. And his plan B to get to Numenor to be taken captive. You know, so he surrendered. He could have run. And instead of running, he surrenders. Why does he surrender instead of running? Because Bricktails, he's got a plan B. Right. He's immediately formulating his plan B. I'm going to stick it to these Numenorians. I'm going to have to do it the devious way instead of by force. Right. Um, but um, but yeah, um, Kurtzim is no Aragorn. Plus Gandalf, plus Elrond, plus Gorfindel, plus Galadriel. No, they, I mean they say that they this that's never on the table, right? Nobody puts. And again, I think that's one of the things that Elrond is setting up here, right? Um, uh, <laughs> Sauron all about making the lemonade would be a good T-shirt, Bruce. Yeah, probably it would. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I. I Yes, again, exactly, Mike. Aragorn is no Elendil, 
right? He's awesome, but he's no Elendil. At no point does anybody suggest, okay, what we really need to do is have a little Avengers assemble moment, right? Um, okay, we can't do it by armies. So let's get let's get uh, Kyrdin out and let's get Galadriel Go- down and let's bring Aragorn again. Let's all get together and we'll do it. They did that before. They did that when they drove, I mean, they did something like it anyway, when they drove him out of uh, Mirkwood, right? When they were attacking the Necromancer, as they thought. Well, no, they didn't think it by then. But anyway, um, nobody even suggests that. And again, I think this is one of the things that Elrond is making plain here. When he's talking about, with his many defeats and many fruitless victories, he's like, look, it's, that ain't happening. Right? I mean, it's, this is not, uh, this is not a viable option. So let's not even think that from the beginning. So yeah, no, they couldn't. If Sauron had his ring, we are told to believe. Gandalf apparently believes. Aragorn apparently believes. Galadriel apparently believes. Elrond apparently believes that if Sauron gets the ring of power back, not all of them together could defeat Sauron. They could not recapture the glory even the fruitless glory of the Battle of the Last Alliance. It occurs to me not even if Gandalf is on a white hole is on a white oliphant at the front. Yeah, I mean it's close, right? It might tip the scales, but no, probably not. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, I think we're good. I think we're good. Um, see, that was not bad. We got through a second slide much faster than we got through our first slide. Um, thanks for... Um... Oh, yeah, so oh, hang on, hang on. Cecilia had a comment that I missed here. Um, uh, Cecilia says, uh, do they not make the suggestion that all of them get together because they know they can't win? or because they want to destroy Sauron permanently and they know that you to, to do that, you have to destroy the ring. Um, I, I, because they know they can't win. Listen, yes, they know they have to destroy the ring, but look, how much simpler would it be, right? If they thought they could take him down, clearly that's plan A, right? Like, so, okay. Okay, plan A, plan A. Let's do the Avengers Assemble thing. Right. Let's get together all of the greatest heroes of the good guys that still exist. Right. Let's bring in Gorfindel. Let's bring in Kierden. Let's bring in Tom Bombadil. Let's see if we can get Tom Bombadil out of retirement. Probably won't work, but hey, let's let's give it a shot. Right. Um, you know, again, like like all the recruitment missions at the begin at the beginning of the first Avengers film. Right. Let's bring everything together and let's take him down. Right. Let's let's overthrow Sauron, and then when he's lying incapacitated. Then let's just take and put the ring in the fire. Well, the ring has to go in the fire, right? But surely, if we could just, like, boom, destroy the opposition first. Let's take Sauron out, then put the ring in the fire. I mean, come on. That's, a, that's, that's less risky, right? But nobody nobody suggests this, right? Everybody. Elrond is first to say, can't happen. Won't work. Um, we can't possibly uh, win in fighting against Sauron. So, yeah, nobody, nobody puts that forward as a viable thing. Um, okay. All right. I'm, um, uh, going to, uh, um, uh, okay. Right. Trifle says technically they do say that they can, but it involves claiming the ring. Sure. Yes. If one of them claimed the ring, then they could overthrow Sauron, but that's the only way it could be done. Agreed. Agreed. Um, Okay. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to say good night now. Uh, uh, we're going to switch over and do our field trip. Uh, so thanks to folks in the town and on Twitter uh, for joining us tonight for our text discussion. Uh, feel free to join us on twitch.tv slash signumu uh, for our field trip tonight. And I will see you guys next week. Next week is the 21st of January. Still be here. Um, a nice full January of uninterrupted exploring the Lord of the Rings classes. Having said that, watch, I'll probably be horribly ill next week or something. But anyway, thanks, everybody. See you guys next week. 
All right. Good evening, everybody. Hey there. Hey. Well, I knocked on wood for you on that one, so. Okay, there we go. Excellent. So, um, let's head back to uh, uh, Thorn's Gate. Yeah. Back to Thorn's Gate to continue our examinations. I think today we're going to look at the uh, the actual Mythgard Kin House today. Yeah, we we got to the uh, we were looking in the housing development last time, and, um, and that was fun. Um, and since we're on Landreval this week, yeah, we could actually go to the Mythgard Kin House there. Um, do you have directions? Like which um, I have one it's in? The address. Yeah, because people can just show up. I mean, I can just port there. Yeah, you can just port there, but... Um, and anyone else who's in our kinship can just port there. Actually, this would be like the first yeah. time I don't have to even go to the stable master for uh, for the field trip. Yeah, um, yeah, but for everyone else, you go to Thorns Hall and then take... Um, you can either ride or walk to the um, housing yeah. area. I guess I might as well do it. Yeah, I think I think we should Go just so we don't that. lose anybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's swift travel the first one, so. Yeah. Matter of fact, I think we can just walk, you know, just do our usual non-stable ride over to the kinship. I should be fine. And the neighborhood is up. Oh, screen just went up. Hang on. What can I do for you? <laughs> the neighborhood is uh, Eldingruff. And the address is number two, Frothing Frothing Road. Frothing Road, that's right. Frothing. Yeah. I think it was by the waterfall. Yes. Uh, yes. That's got its name. Gosh, I wonder if any of my old things are still in there. Yeah, I haven't even been in our kin house in a long time. Not since Smithgard Mondays. Yeah, oh, that's a great idea. Could you type that into Discord? Oh, sure. Where we're headed. Yes. So I, I will head over to the housing area, and I will um, go into the correct neighborhood, and then I'll wait inside the door there for people to come. And then I'll pretend like I remember the way by road to our I house. I don't know if I can actually find the way to the house. I yeah, can just port there. Well, so. that'll, be, that'll be an adventure. We'll see. Okay, hang on. So I'm going into the door now, and I'm choosing... As we, as we joked last week, I wrote it huh. down so I wouldn't have to remember. Right. Elden Graf. Elden Graf. That's the one. Yep. Yep. There we go. Or if you can travel to your house inside the housing area. <laughs> okay. That so here we are. Some. Looking at our cultivated stalagmite again. I think that some of these stalagmites were also... I mean, obviously... You know, as we were saying, because of the slowness of the growth of stalagmites, it's not like all of these stalagmites post-date the building. I wasn't trying to suggest that last week. Just that they were no. first left and then, like, continued to be cultivated. Um, I mean, like, I would assume that these stairs over here, for instance, were built around this. It's not that it has just, like, overflown them like lava or something, but that it actually, um, that the stairs were, were cut around it. Um, so... Okay, let's see. All right, Frothing Road is in the top corner of the road, so if we just ride all around the circumference here, we should reach it. All, all the way around the outside? If we okay, can yeah, do we that, might as well we go. That's, that, 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 that's than a different way than we went last time anyway, so yeah. Better than yeah, trusting let's... our luck going through the middle. <laughs> exactly. Let's go, for a, let's go for a different route anyway. A jaunt. Jaunting around. All right, I like the snowy part. Because, of course, yeah. it's partially open to the air, so. It, but it's also just pretty. I mean, this is the only housing area we have snow in. 
yes. which you know it's always fun you know around the winter winter festival i always feel kind of sad that all the other housing areas you put a snow-covered christmas tree up and uh just kind of looks out of place this place it looks right at home it yes passes this. this is the brotherhood of fate okay, nice right. digs here's, here's that bridge that we went uh -huh. we went across last time and yep, then yep, yep. we went down here down here is the this is the these are the uh the licking columns, right? <laughs> yes. If, if we're yes. supposed to lick the licking columns, yes. These are the licking the columns. Delicious lichen. We're taking That's on right. a lichen to that pillar. <sighs> exactly. Oh, this, by the way, it's not in this neighborhood, but this is uh, this is in the other neighborhood. This one is my house. Ah. Uh. This is the, this is the position of the the house that uh, Wigand and Company own, uh, in the. Uh, I can say this is not actually yet. It. It's in a different neighborhood than our kin house. Is got that nice red paint job? Yeah, yeah. But I really I really like the location of my my personal house there. All right. Okay. And we're oh yeah I recognize the glowing crystals. Ooh. I remember those were always in the background. Look at the stained we glass had our... on these walls. Interesting. Okay. Here it is, home of Mythgard. Okay, we've got a stone of Erech. Excellent. Yep. A lot of trophies. We've got a stone of Erech. We've got a Gondorian army tent. Okay, uh -huh. excellent. Kind of a mini army tent. Hang on, I should dismount here. Yeah. Uh, this was the stage you'd do your, your lectures on. Yes, did yes, I had the stage, the, yeah, the stage I did. Yeah, yes, for Mythgard Monday. I used to we used to come here and I would stand here on the stage and and give talks and people would gather around here. Yeah. I'd stand behind this podium over here. That's right. That's right. This was yeah, that's right. Yeah, when you were like doing your introductions and stuff, you'd stand over there. Oh, yeah, that's fun. Wonder if they still got the snowball. Yep, snowball fight arenas over here. Oh, there's, there's an arena. Actually, have a snowball fight. Yeah, you can have a snowball fight in here. Wow. So, is this seasonal? Do we take this down during the? I think in theory we once did, but <laughs> I don't know, mate. How do I? Uh... I you click on one of the snowdrifts. Yeah, see? There we go. Okay. How do I throw a snowball at somebody, though? It's in your inventory, and then you select a person, oh, and then select the snowball. I'm filling my inventory with snowballs? Um, oh, oh, where yeah, they, they stack. Yeah. I see. Got it. Right. Nicely All done. Right. Okay. It's the parts of the Lotro we don't always well, get to I just, have our fun I with. Keep Beaning fear off here. Let me see if I can aim at somebody else. Oh, try to. Can I aim at Gilgonther? <laughs> yes, I can. Oh, hit him in the kneecap. Oh man. Okay. Oh, that's 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 good fun there. Yeah. Let's see. Inside, I think we have mostly trophies from our adventuring. Yes. What's this one? Oh, let's see. okay. Hang on. Before we go in, though. Before we go in, I want to look at this wall. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ooh, it's dark. So the stained glass. <sighs> yeah. Have we seen that? No, I don't. I don't think remember we have. the stained glass, because most of this wall, I doesn't it look a little dour handy? As well. um, just a little bit. I, it's a bit squarish, though. It's hard to say. You can see the stained glass better over here. This wall's lit. Wait, which one? By the Stone of Air. See, there's oh, the a light upon the, the window. You can see it. Yeah, it's not lit up, but you can see the designs a little clearer. Mm -hmm. 
I yeah, don't know. As, it's, um... It doesn't seem quite as pointy as Dower Handy. It's still got a lot no, of... No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Though the the thing that most makes me think of the Dower Hands is actually, apart from the stained glass and the, the more complex geometric structures within the stained glass, right? Not just uh-huh. the more simple geometric... But is the 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 scroll work up on the top boundary right oh, with yeah. the, the really complicated scroll work which is not geometric but all swirly and everything that looks Oops. more dower handy to me the arches you yeah, know the the, yeah. the sort of the, the the arches the you know pentagonal arches <clears throat> look you know plenty long beardy long beardish but um uh-huh. We did see stained glass in the ruins before Pontine, but didn't we just, but wasn't it always the Dowerhand ruins, the older Dowerhand ruins? Did we see this kind of stained glass? And was it in a clearly Longbeardian place? I'm going to rack my brain for that. Um, yeah, the curious, intricate man. pattern's like, really interesting. It. It, it, almost, it's kind of Aztec looking almost. Well, it's, yeah, it's very interesting. I wonder if it's a revival. I'm not movement. sure. So here, here in the in the walls of the courtyard of our own kin house, I'm discovering a an architectural anomaly that I, I I'm not sure I can explain. Now, it's certainly very possible. Obviously, as Valamoinen points out, the buildings could be thoracic, <laughs> right? <laughs> Meaning, uh, built by Thorin's people when they arrived, um, because of course they could be influenced by some of the older dower handy architecture right yeah um so it certainly this looks new right this does yes, not look it's, it's, ain't like the ancient dower hand stuff right no, it's so pretty shiny i think that this must be new and therefore built by thorin's people um, so it is an art revival possibly possibly um yeah yeah and Tarloni, I agree with you. Somebody's probably going to come looking for the Stone of Iraq before too long. Uh, sooner or later, somebody's going to notice that thing is missing. Okay, oh, Okay. so this is the treacherous hole I should not click on. Yeah, no, 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 no. The Singing I... Bowl of Taralindale? No idea. I wouldn't click on it either. Just oh, okay. I'm totally using it. Yeah, okay, you're totally clicking. Is that music happening? Singing. Because I yeah, I guess music. so. I, I, oh, that must be it. Yeah, it's not really what I think of with singing bowls, but it works for me. Okay. Oh, and here's the little here's the little marigold boffin from the bingo. Oh, boffin right. Towards. There's marigold boffin. Yep, guarding our property. That's excellent. And Bob's we've got a little marigold. old man willow. Yeah, that's cute. He's pretty cute. He's more like a pouty willow than the cranky willow. Yes, he is. And we've got it's like a grumpy cat tree. <laughs> we've got a. Oh, this is. What's our doormat? Trick or treat. Uh, yeah. Oh, mad baggins of gold. Coins. Yeah, chocolate. They they made oh, baggins guilt. Oh, I can't. I can't. I can't the, click on it. Okay. You need to be in a uh, costume for it. Oh, I see. For, right. Got it. For part of the tricks and troves. What are the? What's up with the ingredient for, crates? In, oh, um, it gives you uh, free. Was it crafting ingredients or something? Really? Like once That's a day? Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty. It's huh. a pretty luxe item there. Whoa! I just found three universal ingredient packs. Yeah, not Ooh. too shabby, man. Okay. Interesting. Cool. Boy, yeah. that's luxury right there. Okay, all right. So now, can, can only members of the kin come in? Is that is that what happened? Uh, I don't know. I can look at the permissions real quick. This, I can't remember if we allow people. Wow, this is nice. Permissions. Okay, we've got maps. We've got a nice moose head mounted on the wall. Yes, I believe everyone can visit. They just, not everyone can interact with things in here. Who's armor? General Talug. Uh-huh. Who is this? Uh, I think that was an infiltration one we had to Fiend dress up. Okay, yeah, that's tomorrow. right. Got it. Lupo um, was once more citadels built to refortify the southern plain. Now that the hateful men of Gondor are swept out, 
Who's talking? You can smell the stink of arrogance on all these black Numenorean types. Uh, I think the Spells armor gives a bit of narration there, but I'm not Digging an underground fortress out of the meat. The ground. armor is telling its story? Uh, but okay, yes. that's kind of cool. Below. Yeah. You think we were I digging think it's the only one that does that, itself. though. But if you click on it, you can wear it around. Keep collapsing. And uh, yours are water. very full hats in. <laughs> we have a good laugh at them. Then whip them back to work. I think I need to take that one back and get a few more things, actually. But something happened today. I'm looking at the yes. marks on the map of Moria. Into a large how, chamber, oh. separate how, from the main How does it cabin. get the marks on it? There's runes carved all around. I think we put the marks the walls, on it. The floor, the ceiling. Uh, it comes Mistress with the marks. Mr. Rodani finds them interesting enough. It's to indicate this is a route of travel. If it were up to so. me, we'd leave them well enough alone. Here's what you get for poking your nose where it shouldn't go. Mm -hmm. That Urodani it's supposed to be like Bilbo's maps that were thoroughly marked. The right, with his favorite walks, Next like his favorite know, walks through Moria. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's oh, the Bilbo Boffin map. Oh, I love Boffin walking through okay. faster than you yeah. could cut a throat. Huh. And not a few orcs and orcs, Oh, right. These are, oh, you're right. These well, are all Bingo Boffin ones, so they show you the, the track of next. Right, where, bingos. where Bingo went. Okay. Voice. Okay. Yeah. Nuradani. Thanks for reminding me. I gotta take this coat right back and add some more goodies to it. She fought it. Mm, I don't think I she think won. Yeah, the, this fine, one's accurate at the but it hasn't finished the... Oh, it's a Moria keg. I should probably not drink from this either. No. <laughs> Unless yeah, you want to end up on the... On the, the Red Horn so Lope Goat statue. At last I thought I'd find my yeah. way out okay, we should probably not click on any more talking things. Because, like, I'm... She was Urodani and... Not okay, a dwarf in a barrel. I can't find you know this yeah, don't, don't click on the don't click on the barrel. You'll get reported to Long Lake. She was made yes. of oh, there he is. <gasps> okay, that's new. I, sure I did well not. Did okay, that's not. I was thinking of an apple barrel. Now. This is new. This is a dwarf in a barrel. Wow. There's definitely not a dwarf hiding in this barrel, it says. Okay. From Wolf, whoever you are, you, you got us some good stuff in here. My goodness, yes. That's what we've become. Me and the boys. In League Sinister Keg, okay. Oh, who's this? Ken Dyfe! Ken Dyfe, yeah. Strength and fire aside. Ken Dyfe, the wooden sculpture of Ken Dyfe of completing his correspondence course in the Black Speech. Yeah. Work's nearly done. Oh, a high elf visitor property guard? Yep. Or at least that's what our new master. A lot of really good treasures in here. Need a guard. Oh, I figured out where the the voice is coming from the the lost lore books. That's what they're. That's what I've always said. Someone clicks on him, everybody hears in the second age. Oh my After goodness. Sauron okay, so it's part of the loudspeaker yes, system. Set to work building an army to make war against the king. It's not that I'm not oh, interested oh, in the lore books. In the Valley it's of just Udun, there's Sauron like three of them running at once, and I'm like... And forges and furnaces made. I feel like I'm shouting in a, in a large room. Ground <laughs> okay, so it's what like is this? It's like when you're Disney World and your trolley gets stuck between two rooms. Great wheels <laughs> just burn. like that. Bellows work. Um, and fires okay, so I have a question. One four. What is this thing? One hundred. It this is a grasping maw. A maw. Strange ores. A maw. Yes. Found, right. Whose maw? And where does one encounter broken. such a maw? And these he smells um, into secret alloys. Not with sure. I know. Honestly, more this is steel. the wicked knife. Gulthar and Mormagoth, the Shadowhammer. Does the chat have anything to add there? Because I don't know. I don't know whose maw this, maw this is. So I remember seeing it on the, like, uh, Undun was yielded the, the loading page after a while Undun back. Right, Bricktail says you yeah. see it in your nightmares. The dark host right. No, that's I confirmed. Myth confirmed. <laughs> Yeah, no, this isn't from Moria. The Gladden Mirrors in the Vales of Anduin, says Pontin. That sounds yeah. more like haste to pursue the Yeah, that sounds about right. Over seven okay. years later, yeah, I got but nothing on this guy. Strife yeah. and victory. Did Isildur return as king yes, and conqueror to the Yes, the crowing theory is it's from the Vales, or one, or it's one of the newer Minas Morgul Ridge. Yeah. No, no, I think it's from before Minas Morgul. For oh, nice little winter worm and right by the tundra bear. Dwelt here. Yep. But war, okay. plague, blazon of the great alliance, the kingdom of men. And in time, the watch on Mordor. That is pretty. By cunning, force, and treachery, did Ugruhor, okay. the captain of the pit, seize Duathand and Udun. The tower he made his so. own and renamed to Duathand 
the Dark Oppression. The captain strengthened the fortifications of Udum, restored the old, and built still getting a new. Anglach arose. Stories and about Udun here. Under I'm hearing. Okay. Um, returned, and once again the okay. blazed. Great yeah, Brandon, I can't agree with you that consuming all the lectures at once is more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, That's in the broke it or made it better sort of controversy there. Yeah, exactly. Um, New Morgul blades and other evil implements were hewn from the cursed iron. At least there's only the one happening now. Hidden away in um, dark places. Who knows what evil is still locked away in these mountains? Oh, <gasps> they're done. Okay, nobody click on anymore. Um, no. I'm wanting to look at these banners here. Okay. But I definitely see a Lothlorien leaf. Uh huh. And, and th this looks Con like Con like a Karen Emroth symbol at the bottom, like Karen Emroth, and then the and then the uh, you know a Mauren leaf up at the top. Uh huh. So that would presumably be a Lothlorien banner. Yeah. This would presumably be a Gondorian banner because we have both that we've got the sun and the moon, right? The moon with the tree and the sun with the tree, right? So yes. we have um, we have the two, both Minas Tirith and Minas Ithil represented there. Yep. I assume that those above on the top left is this, those are the signs of Elendil, right? That's why it's a big deal when Aragorn unfurls that banner, because it's not just the banner of Minas Tirith or the banner of Gondor, it's the banner of Elendil personally, which looks like that, yeah. right? The white tree with the well, seven stars. Yes, and then there's the shield of Gilgalad here. Exactly. Uh, the Right, the banner of Gilgalad, which shows his shield with the stars on it, right? So uh -huh. we've got Clearly, Elendo and Gogo at the top, and then we've got Gondor and Lothlorien at the bottom. Who are the two in the middle? The one on the middle right looks like a dwarf. Yes, it thing. does. We've got three mountains and a crown. So I'm guessing this is going to be a dwarf ally. Yes. And then we have a sunburst. Is that one hmm. of the tribes of men? One of the. Definitely looks more like um, different art style, and it's not Rohirrim that we know of. It doesn't yeah. have that look. Well, of course, because it like way predates Rohan, right? So it's it's who would it be um, uh, if if yes? Yeah, so, I mean, if the banner on the right middle there is is the banner of Durin, if that's basically like the you know the Moria banner. Um, which makes sense that it's kind of next to Lothlorien there, right? Yes. Who would be in that sort of secondary position next to the Gondorian banner? Let's see. Well, there's like Dal Amroth, and there's um... Well... It could be from something like Dol Amroth, but mm. yeah, yeah. I can't think what it would be. I'm not saying, by the way, of course, that there has to be textual justification for this. Like it's per very likely somebody that was made up by the Lotro team, but that's fine. I'm just trying to think of like logically who could it be. Um, I don't think Kierden's it would group? be an elvish. I don't think it would be no. Kieran. I don't think it would be an elvish one. I would think it would be an ally uh, of the, of the men. Honor? Well, we no, seen, no, because we Honor is like on the, it. is on the Gondorian ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fourth Dauntless says, "What about the Oathbreakers?" Well, that's what I was thinking. Something along those lines. That is one of the, not the Oathbreakers themselves, but again, one of the human kingdoms. Um, uh huh. Okay, Edith Eldora says she thinks it is Huneric Hundred Slayer. Okay, but who's that? Human? Uh, Question mark? Human ally of Gondor? Um, 
Yeah, because it can't be Anarian. Like it can't be Honor because uh -huh. that's the bottom symbol there. That you've got the tree surrounded, but but you can see it's it's inside a sun, right? You've got the moon, the crescent moon yeah. with the tree, and then you've got the whole sun with the tree on the inside of the sun. So that's clearly if yeah, it's, Honor a, it's down a sun there. motif, but it's very different, and it doesn't match anything we've seen yeah. in any of the rooms. Yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't look like anything like a Thalian North area or anything either. Okay, so Edith Aldora says that he was he was human. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe from the south. I mean, we know the ancient Gondorian realm extended further south than the later one did. Okay. No, see, it's just, it's fun to try to figure these things out before you know the answers. Yep. Ooh, a nice fishing trophy, a 40 pound salmon. That's pretty, uh, yeah. that's pretty impressive. That's one of the better ones. Celebratory scroll pile. Oh Two yeah, lots tray. of those. Okay. Wait, what does it say? Used to randomly alter ribbon color. Okay. Should one want to do that? Okay, we've got some uh, cookery here. This is comfy. Okay. Huh. Trifle says, according to the wiki, they put hobbits at the last alliance as well, which makes sense. It says all the races are represented. Could be uh, a hobbity sunflower, since that's sort be. of their unofficial symbol could around be. here. Marfish. The high seas <laughs> carpet, huh? Yep. Oh, and we got another um, boat motif over here. Tale of a Lendel Tapestry. Ooh, okay. With the Numenorean ship motif, just like we see all over in Numinous. And the star. And then five other stars. Interesting. Okay. Very Numenorean. Uh -huh. And then we've got lots of other trophies. We've got lots of troll trophies. I love the book in the mouth of the troll. That's adorable. <laughs> that is really fantastic. <laughs> Nobody brilliant. click on the book again. Yeah, please don't click uh, on the book. Pony. Okay. okay. Prancing Pony sign. I wonder how many times. Yeah, I wonder how many times they have to replace that sign because people are stealing it. Honestly. Yeah. True. Oh, oh Flora's floor lava. lava. Yeah. Oh, look out. That happens. Oh, you can't okay. jump from furniture to furniture. That's the whole point. It's Flora's lava. Lots of fishing trophies. Uh, oh, this is. Yeah, this is. We called this the professor study. Awesome. Right, we've got our Gondorian study over here, right, with the blue bunting that I'm so fond of. That's <laughs> supposed to represent, like, you know, the sea with the Numenorean yeah, sailing across it. Very, yeah. I think they match the Dilemma Red Stars bookshelf, yeah. Nice. A Hobbit cupboard. Mm -hmm. The Scholar's cupboard. All kinds of scholarly items here. Neat. And uh, and the floor is lava. So there we go. Uh -huh. With the, uh, the the starry chandelier here. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Neat. Excellent. Oh, 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 my feet are on fire. There we go. Cool. I'm just glad that it doesn't do real damage. Right. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody who's contributed to the, uh, to our kin house. It's a lot of fun. Um, we've had this kin house for a long time. 
Um, now I feel like I should go drop down the hole outside in the courtyard. <laughs> See where I end up. Yeah, that's the be conclusion fun. here. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think let's go back out to the courtyard because it is time to let oh. everybody go. All right. So I'm going to go back out into the courtyard here. I'm going to jump in a hole. Here we go. Okay. I'm going to say good night, everybody. Thanks for joining good me night. on the field trip. And now I'm going to jump down the hole. <laughs> See you all next week. Oh, it's been used too recently, it says. So what will you doing? No, oh, that's my bad. I'm sorry. That's okay. Oh, I'm in the Shire. How long does um, uh, it take for it to cool down? Oh, there we go. Hang on. And yep. North Downs. Ooh, I'm in a oh, useful dang. place in the North Downs. I'm at the that hidden cave, um, uh -huh. at the entrance to like the the one that you have to go to uh, that the rangers send you to, and those annoying quests that oh, yeah. uh, way up in the very northern part of the North Downs. Uh -huh. Oh man, this place was really annoying to find, as I recall, <laughs> and even more annoying to I... go through. Where am I? I am in. Um, oh, I'm in. I'm in the tunnels under Scary. Oh. That's where I'm at. And I forget how to get out. Like you do. Okay. Oh wait, no, uh, that was a different tunnel. That wasn't the one I was think. Uh, I was thinking of. I thought I was the one up in. Uh... Oh no! Oh, yeah, so I was thinking of the one in the troll shots. I was thinking of the Someone's one in, the in Forkel and they're only level 28. Oh, Don't no. get in the water. Oh no! Um, that that happened my first uh, my first keg trip, my first keg bender. I found up in Forkel and I think I was 28 and I froze to death in a matter of minutes. Yeah, yeah. Right before like 12 mammoths. Okay, well I just emerged from this cage, uh, this cave in the southern North Downs. By this intriguing set of standing stones. Ew. Yeah. Did yeah, the ones with the people carved on them, or? Just... No, no, just just standing stones, kind of yeah. uh, slightly barrow downs ish, but not with the swirls. Interesting. All right. Think, okay. Uh, All right. I'm going to sign off here in the middle of nowhere right. where I ended up. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining me tonight. And uh, we'll be back again next week. And we'll continue the our exploration of Thorin's Gate uh, around the outside to uh, continue exploring the architectural and archaeological history of the Thorin's Gate region. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.